Spins a web any size Catches seeds just like flies Look out, here comes the Spider-Man Hello and welcome to Amazing Spider-Man Classics, in association with SpiderManCrawlspace.com. My name is John Wilson, and this show is, as I have gotten out of the habit of saying, on a mission to look at every major appearance, every guest feature, and every cameo appearance of the Amazing Spider-Man. This episode, we're going to be looking at issues 33 and 34 of Amazing Spider-Man. I have with me my regular co-hosts, Josh Bertoni and Donovan Grant. But before we get to the actual discussion, I want to uh, remind you that Amazing Spider-Man Classics is brought to you by roll to play roll to play is your online vendor for games and gaming accessories, currently featuring 15% off on all Steve Jackson games, such as the Munchkin series, a big favorite among family and friends. One of those installments is Munchkin Cthulhu, where Munchkins have hacked their way through dungeons, kung fu temples, starships, haunted houses, and super foes. Now they face their greatest challenge, Cthulhu. Will they survive? Will they retain their sanity? Will they level up? Munchkin Cthulhu is the newest standalone game in the Munchkin line, this time lampooning Lovecraft's mythos and the horror gaming that surrounds it. Brought to you by Steve Jackson and John Kovalik, this set features four new classes, including the Cultist and a lot of classic monsters from outside reality. Yours for 15% off at Roll2Play.com, and that deal is going until Valentine's Day. You can also find Roll2Play on Facebook. Just search Roll2Play, all one word, and it is always spelled with the number 2, R-O-L-L-2-P-L-A-Y. Before we get into the episode, I have to warn you that this is somewhat of an unusual setup this time around. We have with us Scott Gardner of the Two True Freaks family of podcasts, and he has been helping us look at the magnum opus of Steve Ditko's Spider-Man career, the Master Planner Trilogy. Last episode, our regular co-host Josh Bertoni was not able to join us. He was with us for this episode. However, you'll notice partway through the first half of the show, he just kind of disappears. That is because he dropped his laptop and damaged the sound card. And so he kind of fades away at one point during the conversation. Then, with Josh being gone, we went ahead and ended our recording with Scott after completing our coverage of issue 33. Then whenever I got together with Josh and Don another night to record coverage of issue 34, as we were talking, we happened to look online, and Brad Douglas was around, and on a whim, we just kind of invited him over, and he was happy to talk with us about issue 34. So, there will be the wrap-up of the Master Planner trilogy with Scott Gardner, and then a break, and then Craven's next hunt on issue 34 with Brad Douglas. So, all of that introduction and setup out of the way, let's rejoin the conversation with Scott. Amazing Spider-Man 33 was released on November 11th, 1965. Ten years, almost to the day, after Marty McFly rejected Leah Thompson's advances. Like a fool! <laughs> <laughs> Even though it was his mom. Dude, she was still hot. <laughs> he would have literally f***ed himself out of existence. This is like, true. Like, like, like Fry almost did in Future Drama. Yeah, exactly. And Donovan Morgan Grant has a synopsis for us. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I really hope I do this justice. Okay. No pressure. Do it, do it, do it. Okay, well, all that's left to be said is The Amazing Spider-Man, issue 33, the final chapter. And all we get is a, on the cover is an image of Spider-Man under a growing pool of water as water is down several streams from above under tons and tons of machinery. This issue starts off with a with a slight recap of a. It's sort of like the end of last issue where you you get you get like you know okay this is the situation. Aunt May is dying of radioactivity in her blood. Kirk Connors is waiting for Spider-Man to return with ISO 36 so that they can get the, the formula working. The Master Planner, who was revealed rather immediately but to be Doctor Octopus in the last issue, are waiting outside the door just in case Spider-Man escapes. And all the while on the, on the underwater base. Spider-Man is under tons and tons of impossible-to-lift machinery, and the one thing he's saying over and over again is this. I failed! Just now when I counted the most, I failed! But I can't give up. I must keep trying. I must! 
Now, this issue is scripted and edited by Stan Lee, plot and illustration by Steve Ditko, bordering and lettering by Artie Simek, and the one that is reading and enjoying that old web spinner is you. That's I wasn't even born when this came out. They're going to try and tell me that they're going to try and put me in the credits. Okay. Possibly one of the most thoroughly satisfying Spider-Man sagas you have ever thrilled to. This issue continues with Spider-Man just as he was under the rubble. And the rubble is ironclad with machine steel. And he struggles and struggles, but he can't get up. It, literally every one of these panels is him trying to get up while water keeps on rising in the, in the bunker. I've got to try to free myself. No matter how impossible it seems, and he tries to struggle. In the next panel, he's he's arching his neck all the way back to show how hard he's straining. And lifting is the only way. The only way. Ugh. He, his head goes back down. I can't. So exhausted. After all that fighting, I feel so weak. Now we see a panel of the ISO 36 a few feet away from him. It's lying there just beyond my reach as though mocking me, taunting me. And that's why I'm starting to freak out as he sees visions of Aunt May in front of him. It's the only thing, the only thing that can, that may save Aunt May. And I can't bring it to her. If she, if she doesn't make it, it'll be my fault. Now he's like putting his face in, in his palm. He's, he, it's almost, it looks as though Spider-Man is crying or at least in anguish. Just like, well, I'll always blame myself for what happened to Uncle Ben. And now we get an image of Aunt May and Uncle Ben with a, with a footnote. From the momentous tale of Spidey's origin, remember? Says Stan. Now final panel. Spider-Man clutches his fist in, in defiant anger. Those two people in all the world have been, who have been the most kindest to me. I can't fail again. I, I can't have that happen a second time. I won't let it. I won't. No matter what the odds. No matter what the cost. I'll get that serve on me. And maybe then I'll no longer be haunted by the memory of Uncle Ben. The panel is now where Spider-Man is a small figure and under the tons of rubble. And it's, it's one of many. But Spider-Man's put his paws on the ground and try to push himself up. As impossible as it seems. And he says, within my body is the strength of many men. And now I've got to call on that strength. All that power I possessed. His elbows start to arch as he begins to budge. I must prove equal to the task. I must be worthy of that strength. Or else I don't deserve it. The weight is unbearable. Every muscle aches. Now his arms are fully straight as he's actually budging the rubble, slowly lifting off the ground. His face is covered with water as, the, as the, the streams of water keep on flowing from above. My head, it's spinning. Everything's beginning to twirl around. The string, it's unbearable. Now we see a panel of the ceiling starting to crack with the water. The crack in the ceiling, it's growing wider, getting bigger every second. I'll never make it. I can't. No, I dare not give up. If I close my eyes, I'll go under. Must stay awake. Must clear my head. Keep trying. His head goes back down, then goes back up, and he starts to, to actually lift it off with his palms under it. But it's still not quite budging. But he's getting there. I'll do it, Aunt May. I won't fail you. No matter what, I won't fail. Now we see a half-page splash of Spider-Man knee down, other knee bent, as he's actually pushing, begins to push it off. And he says, anyone can win a fight when the odds are easy. It's when the going's tough, when there seems to be no chance. That's when it counts. Everything going black. My head... Aggy, hold on. I must hold on. It's moving. Can't stop now. Last chance. Must keep the momentum more. Just a little more. And this goes without saying. There's a full page splash of Spider-Man and all his, his muscular triumph. As the caption reads, as the agonizing ache in his limbs seem unendurable, as his superbly muscled body suffers the torment of a virtually indescribable ordeal. From out of the pain, from out of the agony, comes triumph, and he lifts it off with his bare hands. I did it! I'm free! And it's just so many kinds of amazing. As was Donovan's uh, reenactment. (laughs) Bravo, man. But oh, it's not over yet. His Spider-Man, as, as he lifts and grabs, grabs the ISO, his leg is injured. My leg is hurt. There's a science. <laughs> There's a science. Yoink. <laughs> he yoinks the science. <laughs> <laughs> is that I what they're calling science. it nowadays? <laughs> Ron May is sick. Why is she sick? There's some science in her, but there's hope. We need some science. The science. <laughs> I'll crack the other science, and it'll save her. It's just like Star Trek scripts. Whenever they, like, you know... 
they just write the word tech because they have no idea what is actually going to be said in the show when they're writing the script. They're just like, you know, warp drive, something, tech, you know, and then like the, the, the advisors go in and insert a whole bunch of stuff into the script. So, hmm. you know, it's just funny. The science in her blood is being counteracted by the other science. <laughs> it's working. The science is... Okay. Only one thing can save right now. Science! I, 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 there's, there's someone who should take the panel where he's lifting it off and just say, Science! <laughs> and now it'll be in the Lipson page. <laughs> oh, it better be. Yeah, Spider, as he, as he grabs the science slash ISO 36, his leg is strained, so he's trying, he's trying to get the heck out of there because the crack is... The crack is growing wider and wider, and it's growing more and more flooded with water. But I can't fail now. Not after everything that's happened. There's only one, one way out through the tunnel. I'll just hold a, few, a few seconds. Whoosh! It says the sound effect. My time's out! It's closer now! So there's a huge cascading flow of water just, just pushed right through the building, and Spider-Man is completely overtaken. Because remember, he's at the bottom of the river at this point. I mean, this, he's, in a, he's in a building at the bottom of the river. So there's all those pounds of pressure of water flooding in on him right now. I don't know, how, I don't know exactly how far he is, but his, his, his head's probably pounding just from, like, being underwater that much. I, I, would, I would say. Maybe. I don't know. It's Honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I'd imagine the inside of the building is pressurized. Yeah, it pro- yeah prob- probably. Yeah, he's, he's being flown along with this water. He says, I'll go limp. Let it sweep me along through the tunnel. These few seconds will give me a chance to regain some of my strength. Now, this is interesting because of, um, he's, he's being flown, and um, the captains say that he uh, is bobbing and weaving, as only Spider-Man's amazing agility and sense of balance can keep him from being helplessly battered as the torrent surges from side to side. So, he, so he's using this opportunity to be to, to rest and, and as he's holding his breath. He's grasping the side of a wall as, as all the machinery gets sucked under, sucked to the door. He sees the door and he and he flows right under as he's holding his breath for a long time. And then seconds later, I'm through. There's air to breathe. But little does he know until right now. Right then. <laughs> but suddenly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should say. But suddenly. Oh wait, there's me. more. Over below, pulling me back down. So 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 uh so Doc Ock's goons grab him with. Well, I, I guess it's appropriate for them to have uh underwater gear, but you know whatever. Yeah, they they, they, they they want to kill him. So they're, they're grabbing him, and Spider-Man, he's, he's way too tired to take them on underwater. So, he, so he's like, hey, I have an idea, and yanks out their air, air supply so they'll have to, like, submerge and not, not get on him any longer. But when the hard-pressed youth finally climbs to safety, he realizes that his ordeal is still far from over. There's, like, an entire, like, like district of these, of these bad guys just waiting for them. They look like the foot soldiers from uh, Ninja Turtles. I said the same thing last episode. I was like, and then there, there's the Foot Clan. They That's do. funny that I wasn't the only one who thought that. Yay. When the evil Shredder attacks. The Spider Boy won't cut him no and slack. No we knew you showed up here, Spider-Man. It's the only way out. But the only way to reach us is actually to, for you to fight your way through us. So they don't like take out their guns and kill him. They just gang up on him. But old PD Boy is not having any of it. I've got a job to do. And nobody, nothing... No power on Earth is going to stop me while I still live. That suits us, Mr. Remember, no one lives forever. It's a war. So as Spider-Man takes on the guys, so, like, I don't even know how many against one. And though he, and though he, he's much stronger than all of them put together, due to his leg and his exhaustion, his breath so much, he's actually taking a bit of a pounding. But to him, it's not even that much because his, his spider strength shields him from a certain amount of punishment. So he ascertains that he can actually gain some strength back by getting beat up, which is which is awesome. <laughs> not, not not even the hypno coin can you know can can impede that. Awesome. The hypno coin was actually right whenever he got out of the water. <laughs> there was a okay. hypno coin there. I, I didn't mention. I, I didn't mention either. But um, see, like, like he literally says, this is probably the first time that anyone's ever rested from by taking a beating. But then I was never much of a conformist. Which is, <laughs> Um, As is evidenced by your fashion sense, Peter. Seriously, yeah. Well, at least he's not wearing a bow tie. Anymore. Yeah, well, yeah, or, or, or straight tie. He starts to get some of his strength, but he still can't actually overcome these guys in the beating, even though he's trying to get the upper hand. What's the matter with me? What if my leg is injured? What if they are just more rested? They're digging major crooks. But I'm Spider-Man! And so he, he's, his head's down for the majority of the panels, and he's, he's just punching 
it almost seems like he's punching air, but he's just, just trying to fight his way, trying to regain what's, whatever strength. But it's actually working. What's holding him up? How does he keep fighting? I don't know, but he looks like he's getting stronger. I'm Spider-Man, and I'm not going to fail. I'm not. And now visions of his, his sick Aunt May at death's door is in his, in his, his mind's eye. Not with Aunt May counting on me, needing me. A man may lose. A man may be defeated. It's no shame. It's no disgrace. So long he doesn't give up. And now we just see his, him flailing his fists around. We just see Spider-Man. We don't see the guys for – we see them, but we don't see, we only see them at the corner of the panels. Yeah, it's funny. We're all zoomed in on Spider-Man just, you know, he's obviously not watching what he's doing. He's just flailing his fists around. And then suddenly we pull back and – Yep. I'll keep fighting yeah. no matter what. I oh, my up. God. Everybody's dead. <laughs> I killed them. Their heads everywhere. <laughs> Nobody can make me give up. Not when there's so much at stake. I'll keep fighting until, until what? It, it's over. And I, I really like this panel where like he's still in a pose with everybody on the ground. Like, it's also we know that there's, there's like sparky thing, sparky visual effects around his head to imply that he's totally out of it. Right. Seeing spots or whatever. But like this doesn't stop the guy. He's still ready to go. So, well, he's not ready to go, but he still has. He's on the move. I can't stop now. Can't even look back. Dr. Kyrus needs to see her front me. So he just like Spider-Man is slumped over. He's like limping away, and it's and, like it's it, it's dark outside. It, it looks like in the panel. So he's carrying he, he's carrying the ISO science in his in his, in his grip. And he's just like so all that matters is living the serum time before it's too late. Now he, he hops back a short time later. He hops back through the window of Dr. Connors. Spider-Man, you got the serum. So while so while Connors is about to test out the science, Spider-Man does some science of his own. By, com- by taking out a sample of his own blood and comparing it, so so it was sneaky it'll... science. Well, well, which the point of him using his blood was because it was the only way that it would, you know, see if it would affect the radioactivity in Aunt May's blood, which is all well and fine. But didn't he take a sample of Aunt May's blood, uh, an issue earlier? Wasn't that like the whole point of him taking it? Yeah, to me that um, seems like maybe he didn't want to damage that sample, or maybe Stan forgot, or. Or you know maybe maybe Stan forgot. I don't know. I I don't think I don't think it's, it's a problem. I'll, I'll have to look back at that again. I don't know. Well, it's no, because that was the whole no. point of him ta- using his blood, so he would see how it would affect Aunt May's. Yeah, that was the point because they set the whole apparatus up in the in issue thirty two with the um with the blood and all the orange chemicals, which are pink now, by the way. No science turned them pink. To, to, to get ready <laughs> so whenever they brought ISO thirty six, they could you know have everything ready to go with Aunt May's blood sample and everything else, and so. Now that they've done their science, they're not you know even what? using it. You know, what, you, know, you know what's going on here? Well, um, when, when, before the caption box comes in, you know, like the whole Batman thing, like Sissy's Batman thing, where it's like a spinning bat, and it's like, it's, it's, it's like that, but like, it's the word science and the exclamation point. science. You can basically recap this whole page to say, you know, so Spider Man goes to Dr. Connor's lab where the two of them do some science together. Is that what they're calling it nowadays? That's what you call the last issue, John. He said, Spider-Man powers make science. <laughs> it's, it, it's like a PSA that they show you at school. Is your son doing science? <laughs> Is he locking <laughs> himself in his room late at night? Is he hanging out with friends with lab cults? Well, then your son might be doing science. It sounded like you said lab cults. And I was just like, lab wow. Cult. That takes it to a whole new level. You know, it's a good thing that we don't have a drinking game with the word science on this show because everyone would be drunk by now. Dude, it, it, it's alcohol poisoning to the max, like, in the last <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> Don't let science damage your liver. <laughs> it's these cowards, man. You'll, you'll, you'll never make it through any of the issues. So the the, the the serum works, basically, and Spider-Man uses his own blood sample. Connor's like, how can you be sure it's the same type of blood, Spider-Man? I can't explain, but it is. So that works for Connor's, the, the man of science that he is. And it actually it does work. Spider-Man just hops out the window and says, one last thing, call the hospital and tell them that there's a there's a serum that's meant for um does he say no he doesn't say Mike Parker but he says tell him I'm on the way to the serum a man of rep- your reputation a man of science ask them to give it to him they'll allow me to get the doctor in charge of course I'll do it good luck to you my friend so Aunt May is dying <laughs> and but Spider Man pops through the window here you go I have something for Mrs Parker is she yeah she's still alive but just barely we were given the go ahead that you were coming over anyway. And after a very creepy ad of this whole, now you can finish high school at home. We'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> we see a guy who looks like a statue. Is that supposed to be a black guy? Yeah, it is totally supposed to be a black guy. He's sort of granite looking, but he's supposed to be black. 
It's Tombstone. He's not colored brown either. He's colored gray. It's the gray gargoyle. <laughs> the gray gargoyle, yeah. So they say that it'll take about at least two hours for the serum to do its thing and see if we'll work on that name. So I was like, two hours? Well, I'll just have some stuff to do. Stupid slow like, science. Lousy science in its, in its time. So he says, I don't know, I've done all I can. I made. There's nothing left but prayer. Wait, I almost forgot. So he goes back to the base and finds Dr. Octopus's boy is still unconscious, which is awesome because he basically beat them at, the, at its lowest power level. And they're still knocked out after all that time. So he takes pictures of these guys, like, beaten bodies as only he can. And Spider-Man gives Falswell the, the tip about the goons. And he runs out to tell James and Jameson what he's up to. Jameson is close to giving the really creepy grins he gave in issues 18. But, but he's like, I can can hear the rain rolling in now. Maybe that blast of web is in jail or worse. If I'm lucky. Oh, what a beautiful day this is. So Spider takes pictures of the goons um, being arrested and tells Foswell where to go to get the scoop. And he hobbles, he hobbles back to the beagle where there's there's an entire frenzy. And Jameson's like, his tie is loose. Like, it says a short time later. But it, it, a short time later, there's a drastic change. Like, Jameson's delirious. The master of the gang captured? The identity of the leader revealed? And my paper has a story first? That's great, Foswell. I knew you could do it. But you should have gotten pictures. If only we had fun. Oh, he also says, better not praise him too much. He's liable to hit me up for a race. Even though he's smiling. What a jerk. So um, before I hand it over to our, our resident uh, female impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, you know what? I, I don't mean to come out. You know, the it's I'm like sorry. I'm a drag queen now. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> sorry, man. But it's true. Josh really gets into the act when he makes the Spider-Man Classics episode. Yeah, I was wondering why he wore that wig all the time. Dude, I, I'm, I'm wearing, like, my high heels right now. And... Peter hobbles back, and we see him from the back. We don't see his face, but he's, he's hunched over. Either he's, he's a bum or he's injured. So he, he's, he's trying to get some money. Betty sees this and says, oh, there's Peter. I'm hoping there's something. But what's wrong with this light? He's going hurt. Peter, wait, it's me. I've been talking to you. I want to talk to you. So Peter says, oh, no, not now. So he turns around. and is like, yeah. Your face! What happened to it? <laughs> Nothing much. I just had a, a tough time getting a Zoom set of photos for Jameson. Sometimes a, good, a guy's luck just runs out, I guess. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's no she's like federal case. She, 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 her, her, her hands are like... What? She <laughs> is seriously going into conniption fits over this. He's got a band-aid on his face! Oh. Imagine if she ever saw like a murder victim. <laughs> Selling photos is important to me. I need the extra money. And if I get slapped around the pit once in a while, well, it's part of the job. I'm not complaining, and I'm not quitting my work either. And then <laughs> all, I can, all I can think is that issue 29 did something to her because a normal individual who has, you know, who's allowed to leave the hospital doesn't react this way when they see an injured face. I love this panel. She's getting like you know <laughs> Bennett Brand flashbacks, like and like she she like it, it's the Spider Sense like thing like effect around her, but it's like t- at times twenty. Yeah, she, she's Peter getting shot. <laughs> <laughs> she's like she's Peter. She's like once before I lost someone, someone who meant the world to me because he wanted to live dangerously. I couldn't bear the heartbreak again. I couldn't bear to lose another. It's too much to ask, too much for a girl to endure. Peter, Peter, why do you have that stuff in streak? Why can't you stick to your studies? Why must you always crave action? <laughs> <laughs> and she oh, runs away like crying. She, she literally does. Like she, she runs like with her, with her one hand to her face and the other hand like, like so she won't bump into anything. <laughs> I, know, I just noticed that. I was thinking, God, run right into a door. Right into a door. <laughs> I love that. Dude, like, imagine her with, like, a football helmet and, like, carrying a football. Like, <laughs> and Betty, Betty Brant like, plows him through. Oh, there's like, a line for if you. If this was a sitcom, so be like, but I need another female for my all-girls football team. <laughs> I pick that girl. Like, cute, cute opening credits. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great one. Oh. Now, more than ever. I realize I'm no good for Betty, and I will never be. If she feels this way about Peter Parker, how would she react if she learned about Spider-Man? So, yeah, that, that sucks. Because as usual, their relationship, everything that's wrong in their relationship is all Peter's fault. Right. 
It, yeah, it was, it was his fault he got beat up and everything. So he walks into Jameson's office where Jameson's like literally sweating, his hair is all messed up, and he's so he's so happy about about catching the story. He's like, "What happened to you, Parker? You left something captured out in." I'm not here to win a beauty contest, Jameson. I got something for you. Well, what do you expect? A brass man? Let's see. I'll call you later, Foswell. So Peter pops out the picks, and Jameson's like, "That is true. There is a Santa Claus," <laughs> which is funny. But like a cartoon character runs toward the thing, and then Peter's like, "Whoa! We haven't agreed on a price yet." We can sign your payment letter. You know how generous I am. Yep, that's why we'll settle it now. So Peter's a boss, and he says, you know, I want $100 each, or I'll peddle them elsewhere. And Jonah, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, highway robbery. You're taking advantage of my warm part of generosity. But he doesn't realize they're worth twice as much, he thinks to himself. But I'll take them just because I like you. And then Jameson puts out this this, this puppy dog face of, here's your check. Oh, I'll probably go broke throwing away my money so carelessly. And then Peter, Peter doesn't even like play that. He's like, come off it, JJ. Compared to you, even Scrooge was a reckless devil may care spendthrift. So after that, he decides to go back to the hospital to find out once and for all, despite the leg, how is that made doing? So the doc says, hey, Peter, they, whoa, what happened to you? You look like something, something bad happened to you. <laughs> he doesn't say <laughs> that. Uh, so he checks, he checks his heart rate and doesn't check his blood, luckily, for Spider-Man. And he says, you seem far enough, just on the verge of complete exhaustion. He says, I am, but I had to find out about Aunt May first. And with luck, Aunt May has pulled through, much to the disdain and chagrin of everyone else, except for Peter. Last time we joked about how God didn't answer the prayer that she would die and everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really awesome. But Peter is saying, with a, a smile on his face, which we haven't seen in a long time, I didn't let you down this time, Aunt May. I didn't fail you. And she's moving, Peter, Peter. So all she can say is Peter. So with Aunt May doing well, Peter can finally go home and relax with this final chapter finally closing. So as he's walking away, the doctor watches him out the window, limping away, saying that Peter Parker certainly is a nice boy. He's sincere, well-mannered, and devoted to his aunts. Too bad there aren't many more young men like that. Yeah. Too bad, so <laughs> too bad someone like him can't be an idol for teenagers to imitate and say that some mysterious... Unknown thrill seeker like Spider Man, 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 what, man. What, what, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> Was this about you? She, the doctor wants people to be like Peter, but not like Spider Man. But, 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 but they're the same person. <laughs> There's the wrong, my friend. Irony. You know, and it, we, need, and like, it, we, need like, we need like an irony alert or like, like a sound effect or something. <laughs> we do. I don't know what that would be. We do need one. <laughs> Irony alert. They can kill Bill where it's like... Duh, 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 duh. It's also cool. worth pointing out that Bromwell's opinion of Peter does not stay so high and happy for very long. Is that Bromwell? I, yeah, I didn't think that was Bromwell, but I mean, the, the Mighty Marvel like index probably says it is. Um, Actually, I don't even know. I think like the, it, it's it's they're going to retcon the way that they retcon Tan Skywalker that that was a title. It's going to be like... Uh, Bromwell was just the title of like whatever doctor was taking care of Aunt May because it's such a hard job that like it, it, it's its own position. Like you get the title of Bromwell. Well, I heard y'all yeah. on the Clone Saga Chronicles. I was listening to that today on the episode about who was Ben Riley, and y'all were joking about how like no insurance company would insure Aunt May at this point. I mean, health insurance, house insurance, no one's going to cover her. She's had like five fires. Her life insurance policy has been cashed in a couple times, and you know she's had like 17 heart attacks and 33 strokes. It's just no one's gonna touch her. That's why, like Peter, Peter no matter how much money Jonah gives Peter for these pictures, he's always in poverty. <laughs> and you're and you're right. That, that is not Doctor Bromwell. That is just random doctor. Like why why how this is awesome random doctor and the other ones are not random doctor? I don't know. How awesome would it be if it was Doctor House doing that closing monologue, like in his Doctor House voice? <laughs> seeing as how it's the last page and he's letting down the shade i'd like to think it's dr kevorky and myself <laughs> oh no and then like the pillow goes over on me and there you go <laughs> all that for nothing. wow or, all or that or for it's, nothing or or it's jd from scrubs like doing his i guess we learned something today like thing you know and then of course we have as promised this issue reintroduces craven the hunter <sighs> Uh, in the next issue. He literally like, like, takes the panel and, and like, pushes it aside. 
<laughs> He's like peekaboo. <laughs> That's I, I really enjoy this issue. I like it a lot. But that last panel, the next issue box with was showing Craven. I literally hear the wah 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 because <laughs> oh man, come on! Do you have to ruin a great issue by bringing him back? <laughs> oh no the issue's ruined because of Craven <laughs> I'm not a big Craven fan either although I, I did like the next issue we're going to read but we'll talk about that in a few minutes so Donovan thank you so much for putting your heart and soul into this possibly Steve Ditko's finest hour one of the greatest oh. moments in comic books Amazing Spider-Man 33 the final chapter it, it, it's, this is a, one amazing book and I, I, I use that Term realizing exactly that I'm repeating myself with all amazing. Oh, but, but it, it totally deserves it. I mean, I don't think yeah. anybody's going to argue that this wasn't at least a great issue. What are our thoughts on this? I, I, I have a few notes, but really I was just basking in the story. I didn't write a whole lot down. Scott, what are some of your thoughts on this issue? Uh, likewise, I only have a few notes on this one. I always find it much harder to, to, to take notes and really talk a lot about the issues that are awesome it's so much better when an issue sucks because then you can really get tear into it but (laughs) i've got a few things on this one i like spider-man being able to lift the weight off i I like that he finds his resolve he he finds his inner strength and he lifts it off and i like that because to me it always even though this story is much 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 earlier you know having read these sorts of things out of order when I discovered Spider-Man, I mean, he'd been around for a long time, but I can remember in the newspaper strips when I was a kid, I think they were the Sunday strips, the very first panel, you know, the one that always was the title panel showed Spider-Man lifting a bus, kind of like the, the Phantom mm-hmm. Zone villains, you know? And I remember seeing that and think, you know, why do we never see that in the comics? Why do we never see Spider-Man lift something huge? I mean, right there in the comic strip, <laughs> he was lifting a bus, like a city bus. So I, I, you know, again, I know this story comes much earlier, but to me personally, it feels like a callback to that, that he does have that much strength when he remembers that he does. Right. So I really like exactly. that. I hate to spoil ahead, but I, you know, there's, there's no mystery on this one. I think that, you know, Doc Ock comes back. I mean, come on, we all know that he's not dead, that he comes back. But do any of you guys know how it's explained, how he did escape? He show from... those on me. They, they, they show, they, they do show you in his next appearance. Yeah. Okay. Um, he, okay. he like, he, he's monologue. The next time he appears, actually, it's uh, Peter and Gwen's first date. Yeah, oh, it's, about, it's, it's about 20 issues down the road. It's I after. It's after the big Kingpin introduction three-parter. He comes back in the next issue after that. Kingpin. Okay. There's a miniseries, a Doc mm-hmm. Ock miniseries from around the time of Spider-Man 2, where like Doc Ock like, corrupts another young person or something, which it's very impossible to take place in continuity. But like the only way for it to work is for it to take place between this story and the next one. But that doesn't make sense because the next story is clearly Doc Ock's first outing since – since the master plan of storyline so it just shows that no one cares about continuity in modern marvel i guess <laughs> oh really you guys commented about the serum turning pink i like to think it's because of the uh, bubblegum flavoring that uh, doc connor's added to it <laughs> i'll go with that <laughs> <laughs> all right now again keeping in mind that i really really do love this story and i and i don't want to to rip on it too much there is one moment that brings it down a major peg for me. It's 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 my one. Uh, Is it him lifting the thing off of off of off of him? No, no, no. I, lo- <laughs> I love all of that. It's it's the one moment though that you know where the story kind of goes a little wonky for me because I understand the mechanics of the storytelling and why Stan does what he does, but I just don't buy it. And that's the part where Spider-Man rushes the serum to the hospital. He sees it being administered to Aunt May, and then they basically tell him, well, you know, there's nothing we can do now but wait and see. It's going to be about two hours. So Spider-Man's like, oh, all right, well, so I've got some stuff to do. So, you know, I'll go run my errands and I'll come back in a couple hours. And I'm thinking, no, no, there's no way in the world that he would leave. You know, after all he's gone through, she's on her deathbed. They don't know that the thing is going to absolutely work for sure. It's a wait and see situation. You know, I, I would I would think he'd duck out the window, go to the roof, change to Peter Parker, come back, and he'd be right there at her bedside for those two hours. There's no way in the world 
he's going to go run errands and take pictures and go to the Daily Bugle and all that. I just don't buy it. He's going to go make some money and face his ex-girlfriend while his Aunt May might be dying. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean how don't... horrible would he feel if he went back the two hours later and they're like, yeah, she died like, you know, a half an hour ago. Oh, you wow. Know? Her last words were, Peter, where's Where my Peter? Are you? <laughs> if he really cared about me, he'd be here. Tell Peter, <laughs> tell Peter that, that, that my dying request is to meet that Watson girl. I was say that, like, tell, tell Peter that uh, Anna Watson, when he stopped by. What if issue number one hundred twenty three? You know, what if Aunt, what if Aunt May had died while Peter was off being Spider Man? There you go. And she yeah. comes back. She's like she teams up with Mephisto. Yeah, teams <laughs> the golden oldie. I'm gonna write this story down. It. Uh, yeah, but no, I, I totally get that. And really, that's that's a Steve Ditko thing. I mean, because he's the one who drew this all out. So right. he's the one who had had Spider Man leave. So. Ditko. Um, and, like, he probably had a different reason in mind than what Stan drew because, I mean, I'll talk about it next issue, but I'm totally convinced that, like, Stan and Steve had two different, like, scenarios in mind and Lee was just putting in random dialogue sometimes to fit what he thought was going on. Well, yeah, by this time, I mean, Ditko and Lee weren't talking. They weren't discussing the plots. <laughs> Ditko was doing all the plotting by himself and sending in the artwork and Stan was trying to, have to figure out what to write, which – when you think about this particular issue, look at those first four pages. I mean, how are you going to figure out what to write when all you have is your main character under rubble? I mean, that had to take some take some time on Stan's part. This now, is where he, we're uh, championing the, the documentary, though, right? Because they, they get into that. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things they brought out in the, the uh, In Search for Steve Ditko documentary that Jonathan Ross did, which um, is on YouTube, and it's really awesome. It's about an hour long. Um, did he ever find Steve Ditko? He did. He, he totally yeah. went and talked and to Steve Ditko. Like Neil Gaiman. Yeah, he and Neil Gaiman go up to Steve Ditko and talk to him for like half an hour while the camera crew has to wait downstairs. So, <laughs> you never seen this, Josh? No. Like, I freaking have time, but that's funny. It's really funny. They get down there and they're like, you know, sorry y'all couldn't come up with us, but it, it – and, and, you know, we can't really tell you about what happened because it's kind of like Fight Club. You know, the first rule of Steve Ditko is we can't tell you what happened with Steve Ditko. Even though there was no communication between them, I think that Lee did a great job putting words to the story. The, the plot here with Ditko is amazing. It's one of the greatest moments in, in superhero comics. You know, that really breaks my heart that they didn't collaborate on this because this is such an excellent comic book. And, like, you know, all, all signs point to the point that they probably were giving each other the bird. But, like, really? Opposites attract, and th- th- these guys, the liberal and the objectivist, turned out one of the greatest things I think in, in, in I think in modern fiction. Honestly, mm-hmm. there's really there's there are times where it's, it's kind of obvious that they don't know what they're doing uh, in terms of you know in terms of like uh, correlating with each other. But this, especially with the first several pages, you know, it just looks so. so and the first time I read this a couple years ago, it seemed like that under the under the rubble scene stretched on quite a bit longer. And I don't know why that is, because it's really, I mean, he lifts it off on page five, right? Or page six. And I just, I remembered it when I was rereading it for this time, it seemed like that just kind of flew by. Maybe it's just because I was just, you know, reading the words really quickly so I could take notes for the show. But I remember him being under that rubble. It felt like hours. Well, to me, like, um, as much as I love that scene, I love the scene as, as much as everybody does, really. To me, like, like, this whole issue is excellent. Like, it's just, it's not just that. I love the, I love the fight scene with the guys where he um, knocks them out without even realizing it. Like, I love just the strength of this character, and I love... And being pummeled by the water and, and pushed through the tunnels and everything with all the rubble and everything. That, that's some excellent art. And then, yeah, that's there are lots, lots of good points here. It's, it's, almost, it's not about, you know, the, the wacky supporting characters. It's not about the supervillain. It's about Spider-Man and, you know, what, what he can do when he's pushed, and... I love that. I love. I love that stuff. I, I especially with Spider Man. We say, "Oh, he's the interview Dave here, so he sucks." No, I, I, I like when Spider Man overcomes the odds. You know, I like when Spider Man, you know, pops venom in the jaw or he, he, uh, he picks up a subway or whatever. I, I like it when he does that stuff because if he is every man, then then everybody is capable of you know incredible feats, and that just reiterates the appeal of the character. So. Right. I had a smart ass comment, but uh, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing. What important. was your smart ass comment? You know, I, I know Peter's leg is hurt, and that's why he's shown holding it so much, and he's frequently shown kind of holding his leg, and then his leg is lifted a little bit. And I don't mean to be insensitive to the poor guy, 
but it really does look like he's sneaking a cheek in all those panels. You know, I can almost <laughs> hear the like little sound effects, you know, put in there. So it, it, it's really when you look at it in that context, it's actually very funny. Like the next to the last panel, look at that panel as as the doctor's putting the shade down. Peter's holding his leg and lifting his leg up, and it almost looks like he's just kind of letting one slide, you know? Right, right. I love That's it. That's funny. I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah. And <laughs> as much as he limps, he doesn't really <laughs> mention it very often. Like, if all you're doing is just reading the words and not looking at the art very carefully, it's easy to forget that he has a hurt leg this whole time. Right. I like that, though. I like that, that Ditko continued to draw it. But it wasn't harped upon. You know, clearly the poor guy's in pain, but like you say, he wasn't, you know, continuing to whine about it. He was just kind of favoring that leg. That's that's a nice artistic decision. I like that. It's very realistic. Right. In the spider's web, going over to the letters column, the um, couple that I saw, there's this letter from Bob and Tom Thompson, and they suggest having an animated series entitled Marvel Madness, and they think that it could have a different super character each week. And what's funny is that this is exactly what they do, like, the next year. Mm -hmm. They have a uh, series called Marvel Superheroes that runs five days a week, and each day of the week specializes in a different superhero. It's kind of like what they're doing right now with uh, um, the uh, digital Marvel Comics thing. They'll have, like, Thor Thursdays and Iron Man Mondays and stuff like that. That's what they do with Marvel Superheroes. So, I have to wonder now if they were sort of ripping off Bob and Tom's idea <laughs> and, and, you know, never paid them. Now, granted, it was many, many years later and in reruns, but the cartoon you're talking about, I used to literally run home from school to catch that cartoon, hoping against hope that it would be the one where Captain America fought the uh, the Red Skull sleepers. That was my favorite episode. It was a two or three parter. And I loved it. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's actually, it's good. It's really good. But it's actually, and now that I watch it as an adult, it's laughably silly. But it's still a lot of fun. I've read the uh, I've read the issues that it's based on. I haven't yeah. seen the actual episode though. It's a pretty straight up adaption of. Uh, it was a two or three part story from uh, Tales of Was it Tales of Suspense? Yeah, Tales yeah, of Suspense. Tales of Suspense. Yeah, and uh, yeah, great great issue i like that one because th there's vast leaps in logic in that story where captain america is like i know where you know i know where the sleeper ship's going it's gonna go to the arctic and fire this laser that's gonna destroy the earth and i'm like dude how do you know that i know <laughs> i remember thinking that when i was reading it like <laughs> you know the, 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 it keeps getting more sleeper robots and cap just like knows yeah. what's gonna happen it's it's like his his assumptions are so far away from being assumptions that they're actually on the plot, you know? Yep. That was a really cool idea for a cartoon series that unfortunately I think the execution just wasn't there. Taking the actual art from the comics and turning it into a cartoon and using all of your episodes, base them directly on stories because you're using the art from the stories. And, you know, it, it's, it's a more primitive version of what we have now for motion comics. I got to disagree with you, man. I, you know, as a kid, I thrilled to those. And, you know, anytime I dig them out and watch them today, I still thrill to them. I think they're just fantastic. The, the only part of it, honestly, that drives me nuts today, and I think it bugged me as a kid, although I can't really remember, is Odin like never wore the same outfit or the same <laughs> helmet twice from yes. issue to issue. And so a lot of times, you know, if, if you really are paying attention when you watch the cartoon, mm. you know, there'll be an angle shot and Odin is like chewing out Thor, right? Mm -hmm. And then it'll switch perspective to a different angle. And he's got like a completely different helmet as he's talking. <laughs> and he's, you know, and he continues on his rant and then it'll switch to a different perspective that maybe like a wide shot of like the whole throne room you know with all, everybody else in there and he's got a different helmet again and it's because they're from like all these different comics of right that run and, and they kirby just never had him in the same outfit twice exactly. he was always wearing different yeah. clothes but That's within the funny. same cartoon i mean within the same scene he'll switch helmets like 15 times and it's really you know if, if you start to notice it you can't unnotice it, and it'll really distract you and really drive you crazy. But it's kind of funny because they could do that freely with any other character because they're always wearing, you know, their standard superhero <laughs> same outfit. Yeah, I know. But you do it with Odin, and you know, Kirby was really creative with Odin's wardrobe. 
Uh, I, I do like those uh, a lot, though. Um, I, I guess I never saw them as a young viewer. I only saw them for the first time, you know, as a, as a 29 year old. Right. And while I definitely appreciated them for what they were, I, I do my best, and I think I generally succeed at taking something f- at face value for what it for the time period in which it was created, which is right. You know, I really, really like 1960s black and white Doctor Who. It's nothing like, you know, we would expect today as far as a sci-fi drama goes, but I like it because I know what it was doing and when it was made. It's just these, I I appreciated them. I couldn't get into them. Right. So I, I do want to go back and try to watch more of them at some point, but it's not going to be tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about this letters column is almost every letter People were really on about the title of Amazing Spider-Man 29, Never Step on a Scorpion. Like, <laughs> oh, wow, that's the best title ever. And yeah, it's, it's, it's better than Spider-Man versus a Scorpion or, you know, The Scorpion Strikes Back or, you know, Feel My Sting, I'm the Scorpion. Never um, kiss on an electric fence. Right, there's... <laughs> <laughs> so, you whizzed on the electric fence, didn't you? The electric fence... <laughs> and remember how completely laughable we found the molten man's concept the fact that he was you know covered in metal well mel brown had this to say when i read spider-man number 29 about the molten man i naturally assumed that such a happening an alloy enveloping a man and increasing his strength was virtually impossible not virtually actually impossible he didn't say that that was me <laughs> However, a few weeks later, I read in an old issue of Science Digest that a man's strength may be increased tenfold by applying a metal exoskeleton to his body. Congratulations on your realism, accidental or otherwise. And just my like, jaw literally just dropped. <laughs> it's um, yeah, that's not what they meant, Mel. Sorry, you fail. He got a no prize for that. I'm wondering if Mel went down to the local foundry and like jumped in the 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 metal, you know, the molten metal, thinking, "Okay, I'm gonna make this work." Poor Mel. Poor Mel. It's science time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try out the science and see if the science works. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. Why, Stimpy? Why? There, there now. I know it hurts. <laughs> Does it hurt? So, over at the Marvel Bullpen Bulletins, we have another mighty Marvel hotline report featuring earth-shaking items of monumental inconsequence. There were two points here that I wanted to bring up that I thought were uh, relevant. Okay, from the Let's Be Serious department. Millions of our fans, well, hundreds anyway, well, actually, one of the guys in the mailroom, have demanded to know why Mixed Up Marvel included so many reprints in this year's annuals. Because we had with our Spider-Man Annual 2, there was a 20-page story and then a whole bunch of reprints. Here's the honest to Aunt Petunia answer. We had two powerful reasons. Number one, many of our Raven readers have just joined us recently, thereby missing so many of our earlier masterworks. The reprints in our adorable annuals give them a chance to complete their Can't Live Without Them collections, as does our new quarterly publication, Marvel Collector's Item Classics. Number two, because of our frankly back-breaking schedule each month, we simply no longer have the time to do the double-length yarns we featured in our earlier annuals. So, rather than eliminate these once-yearly spectaculars, we're able to continue them only by combining the old with the new. Contrary to what some brand X subversives have been hinting, it isn't because we're trying to save a few shekels. We can easily afford to spend the dough, we can't afford the additional time, without causing our regular monthly mags to suffer. Anyway, brand X should talk. Their annuals are all reprint. Yeah. So there you have it. We could have thought of a much better excuse if we wanted to put you on, but although we may be corny, capricious, and confused, we've never been less than honest with you. So... Well, so far. (laughs) So far. (laughs) (laughs) That'll change. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. This is, again, part of the whole new, we're going to start deriding DC with our Brand X stuff that they've just started doing in recent months, but... He does have a point that all of DC's annuals at this point were all reprints. They're basically giant size, you know, 84-page collections of previous issues. Or 100-page sometimes, I guess. I don't know. Scott, you were reading DC in the 70s. 
and they had right. left behind their – they called them annuals, but they're more like quarterly sometimes, mm-hmm. big old reprint books. But mm-hmm. as a young reader, would you have found those attractive, you know, big books of – bunch of old stories oh, that came out from I, I did yeah because it was a you know that you know when I when I was a kid you know collecting comics and growing up you know reading comics I mean there were no comic shops you know there there weren't any trade paperbacks you know you couldn't go to Walden Books or Barnes and Noble or something and you know find you know uh, an essentials with all these old stories in it or something so you had to rely on things like annuals and the little like pocket size books, you know, that would reprint, you know, the first six issues of amazing Spider-Man or, you know, fantastic Four stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's how I became familiar with stories that went way back and especially like early Marvel. I I loved the fact that, you know, here Marvel had only been around for a short while yet. They were already mining you know, their own material and reprinting it like crazy because they knew that there was that demand. People were trying to get up to speed, you know, on these back issues that were now, you know, very hard to find even at that time. So I think that's great. I think it's excellent marketing that they knew the demand was there. So they just kept pumping it out. And uh, yeah, I loved reprints back then because it was the only way that you could access some material, especially like with Superman. I really dug... And when they would do these great big, like the 80 page giants and stuff like that and, and reprint just tons of old stuff from like the forties and fifties, I dug that stuff. It was one of those things that I, I mean, whenever I was collecting in the early nineties, um, Marvel tales was basically the only surviving reprint right. book. So I didn't, I didn't want to get those because I didn't want to miss out on number one. Uh, and we may have talked about this before if I just, you know, kept on buying, I, they would have rebooted number one eventually. Uh, I should right. have, that was another episode that we talked about that. But, um, but yeah, having like a big old chunk of reprints, and I guess with DC, a lot of the stories were, were less connected than the Marvel stories were. Uh, right. Marvel was, it was more important to kind of feel like you were going in order. Uh, whereas that, I don't think that was quite as big a deal in DC in the sixties and early seventies. Not at all. No. So there's that. We also have here the How About That Department. You'll see the name Roy Thomas popping up here and there in our ever-loving editions. Roy's a fan who's made it. Although employed as a school teacher in St. Louis, his subject was English, Roy never lost his love for comic mags, Marvels to be exact. So after a lot of correspondence back and forth, we decided it would be cheaper to hire him for the bullpen than to keep shelling out money for those airmail stamps. Now that Roy's aboard... We're betting our syntax will be sensational, and there won't be a split infinitive for miles around. Sounds like the grammar Nazi that I am. So uh, I bring this up because Roy Thomas actually did write for Spider-Man. He wrote Amazing number 101 to 104. Right towards the end of the Stan Lee run, he covered four issues. So he is definitely part of the Spider-Man universe and a huge part of both Marvel's and DC's history. Scott, you know more about that than I do. Well, yeah, that's uh, something I was going to throw in there is, uh, you know, it directly affects not only Spider-Man, but all of Marvel. I mean, Roy Thomas is literally considered to be the man that saved Marvel in the uh, late 70s because he took Star Wars to Stan Lee and said, we need to do this. We need to adapt this. And it was the uh, the Marvel adaptation of Star Wars and the subsequent series that uh, – is largely credited with saving Marvel back then, back in the day. So, yeah, Roy Thomas, a very important person in Marvel history. I mean, just all the different stories also that he's, he's, he's oh, crafted. Oh, yeah. And the you Avengers know, the, uh, and the... Uh, the Kree scroll War and, yeah. Right. Did he do it? Did, did he do the Invaders? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. He did the Invaders and... Uh, I'm I'm more familiar with his DC stuff, but yeah, he he most definitely would. Well, I mean, he was kind of the next guy after Stan. You know, when Stan started bowing out of the titles that he had created and and written for such a long period of time, in in most cases, Roy was the next guy. You know, I know he was on like Avengers and um, FF, and I want to say 
X-Men as well, but I'm not quite as versed on, on X-Men history and lore as, uh, as the rest of the stuff. But yeah, definitely one of the biggies, one of the important people of, of comics history, you know, of, of this era of comics history. And we'll be pulling a lot of his issues in with the have Spider-Man cameos. He because uh, mm-hmm. Spider-Man shows up in Avengers books, and there's I think an issue of the Cat. I don't know if Spider-Man shows up in the Cat or the Cat shows up in Marvel Team Up. I know the second one happens. I'm not sure if the first one happens. But You're anyways, the, the female Cat that becomes yeah that became Hell Tigra cat? yeah became Tigra yeah or Tigra yeah that's right yeah. I'm thinking of uh, Pat Patsy Walker or whatever. Right, Patsy Walker. I get Walker. those two confused a lot. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. So <laughs> <laughs> there's one other thing I want to pull out of that page, and it says in the strictly personal department, a few fans who must have sent their sense of humor on vacation have written to ask us why we always insult adorable Artie Simic and swinging Sammy Rosen on our crazy credits. So we want to state here and now that we love those two talented, hardworking, dependable letterers of ours. Those little squibs we write about them are strictly all in fun. We think they're the greatest. But if they forget to capitalize Stan's name once more, watch out. And I just (laughs) brought that up because, seriously, every time we read a comic and they make fun of Artie or Sam in the letters, Lily gets a kick out of it. I mean, she's always... Oh, really? Yeah, she loves the credits (laughs) and loves how they pick on Artie and Sam. She wants to give Artie and Sam, like, you know, big old cakes to make them feel better. It's pretty funny. Aww. And also this month we had an ad page for Fantastic Four number 47. This was where the Fantastic Four have found the hidden land of the Inhumans, cut off from the rest of civilization. And this issue wraps up the Inhumans portion of this continued story. It's been running the last three or four months, but the story still doesn't end with the full resolution. Uh, it's a little bit of a cliffhanger ending, and it goes right into the next issue, which will have a historic turn, as we'll see with next month's books. And the mm-hmm. ad page also has the first issue of Marvel Collector's Item Classics, which we think we've talked about on last episode. Mm-hmm. So there's that. And that pretty much wraps up issue 33, unless anyone else had anything else. If you've not read this issue, then... I, it, I, I, want, I want to focus on something rude and insulting to so they will read it, but that never works. So read it. It's fun. Go ahead. Read it. <laughs> it, it, is, it is classic Spidey at its core. I mean, if you want to consider yourself, you know, Spider-Man. knowledgeable of Spider-Man historical, you know, whatever you want to call it, this has got to be on the top of your list. 31 through 33, but especially 33. It's just this is what it was all about. Yeah, if you, if you think you're a Spider-Man fan, if you're not read this, then you better pop that gooey cherry and just read it. <laughs> oh, man. I know I'll live to read that. Wow, the things I get to leave in when I want to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you know what? We're going to um, wrap up here. I do want to say thank you from the bottom of my fandom heart to Scott Gardner for being with us for this storyline. Uh, oh, thank you, Master Planner, and it's been great having you on the show, Scott. Thank you very much. It's been awesome to be here. I really enjoy your show, and uh, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. I get to hear all the behind-the-scenes stuff that gets cut out. I love it. <laughs> there has been a lot. Yeah. <laughs> just, just don't tell everyone what I did to that one girl. We will be. Um, oh, wait, is this the one that's in the backyard, or is this the one that's under that bridge? There's more than one. <laughs> <laughs> or no, it's just the one that's by the by the freeway. Yeah, yeah. That one, okay. Yeah, all don't right. say what I did there. All right, all right. This is the third recording session we've done together for your show, and damn it, I've forgotten every single time to mention the fact that I listened to you guys all the way from Georgia to Florida. You know, that, that first drive that I had when I came down here to stay with my friend and look for work. It was tough. It was really tough that day, leaving the house. You know, my wife was in tears. My kids were in tears. They were all upset. You know, we didn't know how things were going to work out, how long it might be before I got to see them again and everything. It was it was very emotional. And so I needed like, you know, I just needed some friends or, you know, like I like to hear. I don't know. I'm not explaining it very well, but, you know, just just to hear familiarity and, and, you know, friends and some laughter and some lightheartedness and all that kind of thing. 
And so, you know, I put on my MP3 player, like all the episodes of your show that I was backlogged on. And I listened to that nonstop the whole way. And it was like you guys were there with me on the drive. And, and, and it just really, you know, I mean, I, I had been enjoying the show anyway, but it just was that extra touch of really endearing you guys to me. You know what I mean? Because you were there with me during a very tough period and during that drive. So I, it, it, it was like a, a almost like a weird bond was formed kind of thing, if you understand what I'm saying. But it was really cool, you know, and I, and I, I like the show for a lot of different reasons. For one, I think you guys are very authoritative. You definitely know your shit when it comes to Spider-Man much more even than I do, you know, w- with things that should be more from my era than yours. But you know it a lot more because you're really, really into it, whereas I've read, you know, the offhand story here or there. But then you've also got, you know, what I think is probably the most important element for any podcast. You guys are just funny. You know, you crack me up a lot. You know, you come up with a lot of good stuff off the cuff. You know, it's not one of these, you know, you sat down and you scripted out a bunch of jokes and skits and stuff and it and it feels forced or fake. It's, you know, you guys come up with stuff off the top of your heads as you're rolling. Th- that's the best kind of laughs to me. And, and you guys keep me chuckling through most all the episodes. And that's really important because I, I love a good authoritative podcast as much as the next guy. But I find a lot of authoritative podcasts take themselves a little too seriously and they forget to have fun. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And so I I will sacrifice a little bit of seriousness and authoritativeness for somebody that's just cutting up and having a good time. You know? Those are always my favorite shows. I'd, I'd much rather laugh and feel like I'm hanging out with a bunch of buddies, you know, talking about things that I like to listen to rather than listening, listening to a college lecture that's dry and boring, even though it might be really informative, you know? Right. So I, I well, hope that came off as the compliment that I meant it to be. <laughs> it, it, it's like unbelievably <laughs> awesome that for you to say all that. <laughs> oh, um, wow. I, I'm... I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> we're, we're, we're happy to do it. <laughs> no, no, like, like, like seriously, like, like we're, that, that, that's great. Like, like I, I, we're both really, really, really happy that we can entertain somebody. Just, just one guy, just so much. That's that means a lot. Well, I, it I, does. I mean, it it, it means else. beyond I, a lot. That's awesome of you. To I, I appreciate you, Scott. His podcasting out the wazoo over at two true freaks dot and I have to say he not only puts out a lot of content but he puts a lot of effort into his content it is one of the best produced most professional sounding shows out there and I strongly encourage you that if you have an interest in Star Trek or Star Wars or comics of various types or you just want to hear people geeking out about geeky things there are several things over there for you at two true freaks dot dot com. Is there anything you want to say about the shows and what you'll have going on right now, Scott? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of build up. Thank Sorry. you very much. Now the pressure's on. No, let me see. Um, well, I, I think we covered it pretty good last time around. You know, we uh, once a month we do an episode about Star Wars. Once a month an episode about uh, Star Trek. Then we cover comics, like you say, of various sorts. Um, I do the Jonah Hex podcast, and I've got projects with uh, Mr. Michael Bailey, former guest on uh, on this program, where we talk about the Justice Society of America, amongst other things. So, yeah, check us out at uh, Two True Freaks. we got something for just about every taste over there. Plus, uh, we have a, a new uh, member of the family, Hope Mullinex, who's uh, really bringing a lot to our feed with uh, covering – manga and anime something that uh i am woefully ignorant of so she she covers that whole thing very well and and adds a whole new dimension to uh, our little family so we really appreciate her so yeah come check us out and i have to say that your tales of the justice society of america when i heard y'all were starting that up last november very very excited i i've read a lot of golden age DC and some Marvel and just several of those heroes and the all-star comics were amazing. And I know that they have gone on so many adventures and done so many wonderful things in the modern universe. I know nothing about yet. So it's, it's a combination of 
really enjoying the stories y'all are doing in the 80s and also really anticipating the stories we're going to be doing with the 90s and 2000s and stuff. So I'm looking forward to where that's going to go. It's it's a journey I'm relishing as we go along. Oh, so thanks. They're, they're currently doing All-Star Squadron in, in that series right now, and it's, it's good stuff. So yeah. Scott Gardner, yay! Hooray! <laughs> thank you, thank you. After these messages, we'll be right back. Yeah. December 7th. Earth 2. 1941. A world very much like our own, yet slightly different. A date which will live in infamy. A world at war. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Following the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt brought together the largest group of mystery men ever assembled to battle the Axis powers. Tales of the Justice Society of America presents The All- Star Squadron. The Tales of the Justice Society of America, every Friday at twotruefreaks.libson.com. Joining us for the second half of the episode, kind of on a whim and by his good graces, is the webmaster of our very own supporting website, SpidermanCrawlspace.com, Mr. Brad Douglas. Hello, everybody. Hello. I, I just back. missed reviewing uh, issue 33, which was one of the best Spider-Man comics of all time. So let's do the uh, the Craven one. <laughs> 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 let's lift some stuff off his back and then put on a fake Spider-Man costume. We made a deal with Aiden a, a few a few uh, episodes <laughs> back to have you on for this episode. So Oh, he, oh you did? Okay. <laughs> you may not remember you were in the busy of transforming back into Eddie D'Angelo. So. Oh yeah, ear, 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 ear. I need like a transformer sound effect. <laughs> I go wow. from like a, when I go from like a car to Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> roll out, Autobots. <laughs> Autobots, roll out. <laughs> but thank you for having me on, John and everybody. This is on a whim. I was just updating the front page, and they and I got an IM that said, "Hey, hey, hey, kid, you want to be on the on a podcast?" And uh, I said, "Hey, yeah, why not? You know, I also like to buy a watch from you, John." <laughs> not realizing <laughs> this is how you got on the first time. We're on a, in a back alley podcasting on Spider-Man comics. Them damn kids. Hey, so and it's the alley, and, and CSC is the bathroom. Yeah, there was a guy with a Spider-Man mask and a gun. Saying buy this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the f up and download my podcast. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> for those who are newcomers to the show or haven't heard all the back episodes, Brad was with us for the previous uh, Solo Craven story issue oh, number fifteen, oh. and now here we are. What is this? I can add issue. nineteen issues later, oh. and we're having him back on the show. It Brad? seems like I'm a Craven expert, but I'm not. It's just because I have those leopard print pants is why you have me on. And you're wearing those, right? You said you were. I, I am. <laughs> Actually, right, I'm awesome. just wearing the briefs of them. <laughs> and they're, they're, on, they're on Facebook right now, and um, oh, yeah. uh, let's move yeah, on. Dude, it's yeah. hot, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, nice. it's too hot for my eyes. Too hot to handle, too cold to hold. Who are you going to call? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> The Ghostbusters. I just broke out some Barbie Bear, cool. Robbie Brown Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack. I apologize. Wrong podcast. Oh. <laughs> so Amazing Spider-Man 
34 was wow. released on December 9th, 1965. It was the final book of the year. It had a March 1966 cover date, and Joshua Bertoni, back with us again, shall talk us through this issue. Yes, no sound card problems, <laughs> at least right now. Well, you know, we talked about those last two Craven stories. What would you say, like, is, is your favorite Craven story ever, just out of curiosity? Craven's last time. Craven's last time. Yeah, that's a good one, because that's the one that starts off with Craven. He's, like, in a room full of trophies attacking them, thinking that he must defeat Spider-Man. He winds up impersonating Spider-Man. He attacks some muggers and, like, you know, gets, like, really brutal. The woman that Spider-Man loves can't sleep at night because she's so worried. And then at the end, Craven does that confession. Oh, because of honor. <laughs> Am I talking about Craven's last hunt? No, I'm talking about issue 34. Oh, God. It just dawned on me. Yeah. This is- well, okay. if nothing else, Craven impersonating Spider-Man. So, um, but he's not doing that on the cover. On the cover, Spider-Man's just, you know, he's standing on the side of a building, and he's looking up like, what the heck? And there's Craven, legs open, about to land on him. I hate when that happens. Oh, God, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the, the spider hump indeed. count just went up by one. <laughs> 1,000. Uh, the, the hunt indeed. I always, if you don't mind, I always like to see where we're reading this from. I've got Marvel Masterworks number volume 16 I'm reading from. What are I you reading, Essential Josh? Spider-Man volume 2. I'm doing from a Masterworks. And I have John? the uh, the DVD scan of the original issue that Marvel released. Ah, there you go. Cool. We should we should do that more often. I mean, usually it's the DVD and Don's doing essentials. I always like to hear where you guys are reading it because when you get to the 70s, you're probably going to have the original issues. Or John's not. He's going to still have the scans from that DVD. The Amazing Spider-Man: The Thrill of the Hunt, featuring the somewhat magnificent menace of Craven the Hunter, scripted and edited by Stanley. Plotted and illustrated by Steve Ditko and lettered and relished by Sam Rosen. Over in Nairobi, Craven is monologuing to a room of dead animals, as one often does. He killed them all with his bare hands, which should be mighty impressive, but apparently his room is not complete unless he has a Spider-Man mask. Go figure. He must hunt and retrieve Spider-Man's mask for his trophy room. He tells the dead animals this and then tells an attacking lie in this. Actually, <laughs> Yeah, actually, Craven just kind of picks on the lion, and, you know, like, he sees a lion, he's like, you lion, I hunt you, I am the superior hunter, and then... Hey, I love him. the I love the word balloon, look no further, Simba, you have found your prey. <laughs> love it. Did this anyone read this before man. having seen the Lion King? Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Poor Simba. <laughs> I just can't wait to be so, king. So Craven grabs the lion right by the heart, doesn't he? He, he picks on the lion. He, he bullies know, that thing. He's like, he's hurting oh. its feelings, and he makes it, like, run away. Look at the lion in the, um, um, on the next page. Look at him, like, running away. He says, flee, Simba. I it's like you. the lion's been bitch slapped. He's like, ah. He has been bitch slapped. The, the lion, like, <laughs> needs to go to therapy. That's because but- Craven's all riding high on the drugs he just took. I know, yeah, like, last time we did a Craven story, there was, like, some question about whether Craven gets his powers from his potions. But here it's pretty much stated that he's getting his power, at least increasing his strength through these potions that he's drinking. It's the jungle super formula, or super soldier serum. It's, it's literally jungle juice, like the actual drink. It's jungle juice, there you go. It's jungle juice, yeah. You What's up it? with the next panel on where he's on the dock? It looks like he's Ernie, from Bert and Ernie, where he's got a shirt that's red. <laughs> what is that about? He looks like he's borrowed a wardrobe from Ernie. That is, that is a random panel. Actually, yeah, he's like, oh, days later, he actually happens to be doing this right now. It's like one of the very few times you ever see him not in his right Craven outfit. I know, I know. <laughs> no one will see him in that disguise. Which actually goes <laughs> to, the, to the next trivia question. What does a Russian fugitive do when he's been deported from America? Go aboard a ship delivering animals to an American zoo. Thank goodness for security in the Marvel Silver Age. <laughs> That's nice. But meanwhile, an ocean away, we find yes. a startling. Unex- <laughs> well, did I hear a yes? Yeah, because it, <laughs> it's one of Betty Brant's hysterics. And- well, Betty Brant's going ape on this one, man. Oh, this is this is a, actually a very sad moment for me. This is my last Silver Age Betty Brant performance. I mean, oh, Steve Ditko, excuse me, my last Steve Ditko Betty Brant performance. What does Betty not show up for a long time after this? 
This is her last. Uh, we'll get to it later, but this is her last Steve Ditko issue. She's not going to show up again till the Ramita run. A moment of silence. Like what issue that's, does she show our, up again? That's our golden goose. Um, in issue four, in issue forty, you see her oh. at a train station, thinking, "I must go back and make a decision about Ned, <laughs> Peter, and Spider Man." <laughs> and then, like Holy one crap. issue later, she runs into Peter. She's like, "Peter, we have nothing to say to each other." Hi, Ned. <laughs> Playing safe with each other. You, you and your your Betty Brant. I, 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 I just it. spoiled the next like years worth of Betty. Oh, no, dude, it's all right. This 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 chick's crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's just> like... <laughs> no doubt. And and why is she crazy? Let's look into what's going on in Ocean Away. <laughs> I know you're keeping some terrible secret from me. You must tell me what it is, Peter. You must. Very well, Betty. You have the right to know. As Peter. Climbs onto Betty's wall or whatever wall they're supposed to be on. <laughs> Get a good grip on yourself, Betty. This may be a shock to you. Peter! Peter, that's just one of the names I'm known by. Oh, no, no! I also answer to another name. The name of, as he rips open his shirt upside down on the ceiling, revealing the Spider-Man costume underneath. The name of Spider-Man! Not you, Peter! Not you! If you look at that very bottom panel, doesn't that plant in the background look like from that episode of Star Trek where they went crazy down the planet where the plant shot stuff at them? Yes, the paradise. Spock, yeah, Spock Central. started uh, hanging from trees and singing. <laughs> Remember that, <laughs> that one? Was, you know, and yeah. he is like one of the few times you saw just how big and goofy Leonard Nimoy's grin is. Exactly, dude. That's... that's <laughs> I, he's actually kind of scary when he smiles. I I, I sort of run away a little maybe bit. Maybe that explains Betty Brant's uh, and uh, how she's insane. She's been attacked by that giant plant. I love how world. Peter is so blank faced in the dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just spoiled it. It's a dream. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. You should not tell because he's um he's walking on the walls with his shoes on. Of course, that explains it. I don't. You know, I Lionel Richie did that in the eighties, and nobody thought anything out of it. Has it been cool. established at this point that he needs his shoes off to walk on walls? Like, no, that's a retcon. That's that, yeah, that's always been like a retcon. Yeah, because okay. I don't know if we like actually have that address that he can't walk on walls with his shoes, but but like, he is, but he has boots. I mean, he's Spider Man. Like it's a ve- it's like one of the most inconsistent things about Spider Man's uh, abilities, I think, and it kind of annoys me whenever he says, "Well, obviously, I must take off my shoes." It makes some sense, but when when he's Spider Man, how does that work? I think that the fabric on the bottom of his boots is really thin. I don't think it's like sock thin because there is some protection against roughness in the ground, but it's relatively thin. But there's a there's a quite a long while in the 70s going into the 80s where Peter pretty consistently ties his shoes, shoelaces together and puts them around his neck whenever he needs to go wall crawling as Peter. Mm, I do remember that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it was established this early on, but... No, in AF15, he closed climb, climbing up the wall with the shoes on, so... So, Alex Ross, a, a lot of times, when, when you see Spider-Man swinging, like, he'll draw the boot. You can see his, the foot shape in his boot, to, I guess, to, uh, to illustrate how thin the boot could be. But I don't know. I just, I just, don't, I just don't like that. But whatever. He has toe socks. Maybe Betty was watching that episode of Star Trek before she went to bed, so the thing subconsciously <laughs> appeared in her dream. Uh, you know why that's physically not possible? This is how geeky I am. This issue came out in 65. Star Trek went on the air in 66. So sorry. <laughs> This is where they got that plant from for that for oh, that planet. Oh, Roddenberry was uh, staying up late reading some Ditko <laughs> and Stanley. You know what? The idea of Gene Roddenberry being a Spider-Man fan just makes me happy. I'm gonna go that with that. Ju- feeling. It just makes my mind explode like Don. You're, you're gonna do what? That last <laughs> panel on the bottom. It looks like Betty's like. If, if you blank out the word blooms, it looked like Betty is using her psychic powers to like make Peter <laughs> shirt. Open. It does look like a Professor Xavier thing going on. Like there. a Jean Grey kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Look at her left hand. Betty, don't do this. Oh, dude, what's up with her left hand? Her Both of her hands are all kind of funky there. Her oh, left man. hand is really curvy, and her right hand is just sort of it's, deformed. It's not I, – I know I know what you mean, but – because it's, it's sort of like the angle and how Dicko's style is. I, I see what you're saying, but it doesn't – I also see – how he drew it, and not, it's not a bad hand in my mind. I also see more Star Trek in that panel. That's what the in the remake movie when Kirk's hands blew up because Bones shot him with that stuff. <laughs> to get him yeah. on the ship. I need to stop. This is not a Star Trek podcast. <laughs> Look at Peter's last panel, the the third one in the second row. Look at his hand. 
Oh wow, it looks like that. A that looks like a Gumby hand or something. That's kind of <laughs> well, maybe like because this is a dream, anatomy's crazy. Like in Betty's dream, her hand like grows like really. Now big. I'm gonna be looking at every single hand. I know I I understand that hands are one of the hardest parts of the human body to draw yep. uh, realistically. So I'm not faulting Steve Ditko for it, especially since it's so small on the panel. But really, some of these hands look really funky. And now I'm going to be looking at every single one of them. In the next, in the next page, she's checking her hands in the second panel. She's like, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. Yeah, okay. Let's make sure that they're, all, they're on point. We're really milking this, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Well, as, as John spoiled, this is a dream. As we see Betty waking up in her bed on the next page. No, not you. I can't. What? I've been asleep. It was only a dream. Oh, thank heavens. It's not so. I merely dreamt it. I can't stop thinking about him night and day. Whatever Peter's secret is, whatever he's hiding from me, it can't be that. It's no use. I can't fall asleep again. Not with the knowledge that I must make a decision about him. I cannot put it off any longer. And then Ned wakes up and says, Betty, go back to sleep. <laughs> Okie dokie. And then you'll, you'll, she never thinks about Peter again. <laughs> okay. For, for those who don't have the issue in front of them and like are taking note, Ned, Ned Leeds is not in the bed next to Betty Brand. But. If you look at the very top right panel, you see the uh, lamp. Doesn't it look like there's little spiders crawling on the lamp? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. It was and intentional. This is, <laughs> this is the last we're going to see of Betty for a while. It's and crazy. Run. I'm like, I'm, I'm <laughs> very awesome sad. Thing. She's like, Steve Dicko, Betty Brand has been like a cornerstone of this podcast. And it's like, the only reason anyone listens to it, not us. Well, you guys will have to fill in what you think she's doing. Give give yourselves an untold tale. Where do you think <laughs> Betty Brand is now in, in, this, issue, in this issue? Like, what yeah. is Betty Brand doing this issue? If you exactly. then leads flirt, flirting with other men, <laughs> you win. No doubt. But she's seriously, though, I mean, she she can't decide whether or not to marry this this high school kid. Well, he's not high school anymore. He's just started college. But and and she's so distraught that she's going to leave her life behind, including the Daily Bugle. You know, like, hey, don't give two weeks' notice or anything. You know, it's not like you did that in issue ten. Oh yeah. <laughs> was two weeks' notice a common practice in 1965? I'm just randomly wondering that. Was what? I wish, I wish what was? Jr. was on the show. <laughs> Oh, we could ask him about 1865. Oh, well, when I was doing that, Betty Brand is a horrible person thread on Crossface. I somebody said, well, she's devoted to her job at the Bugle, and I literally named about five or six times that she's quit the Bugle without e- without giving notice, and like times that she's quit for stupid reasons, like <laughs> she, she quit like because herself. she had to go to marriage counseling. You don't quit your job when you have marriage counseling. <sighs> we digress. This this breakup may be tearing Betty apart, but Peter's on top of the world. He, he's even doing cartwheels. <laughs> Aunt May's out of danger, and he's excited that he's actually going to be able to go to college without Aunt May hanging over his head. It's enough to make a guy do a dicko drawing cartwheels around the house. <laughs> he visits Aunt May at the same time as Anna Watson, and the doctor gives May the clearance to go home, and Peter heads to college. And yes, from one crazy woman to another, we have a bunch of guys crowding around Gwen. Come on, Gwen. You promised you'd go to the game with one of us. Admit it, doll. You've decided on me. Uh Uh-uh. I'm the lucky guy this time. (laughs) Give us a break, Gwen. Who is it? Sorry, lads. I've got to rush to class now, but I promise to think about it. But you've been keeping us on the string all week. I know, and you love it. Honey, the guy who finally takes you out of circulation will be the most hated Joe on campus. So dated. (laughs) <laughs> so this this kind of gives us a Id- little more idea of what Gwen's love life is like at this point. I mean, she's freely dating. She's not serious about anyone. And none of her dates she t- she's taking very seriously either. So that, that's something about her we didn't really know before now. She's, 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 yeah. she's very self-centered, too. Why, why do we care for this character? I mean, I don't. Right <laughs> why have we ever cared about this character? <laughs> I know, because dude. <laughs> this is only her second issue. <laughs> I know, but such a... Uh, I know. Well, she walks off from all the guys singing. Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? Yeah, yeah. It's like walking off. And this reminds me of the, of the scenes of uh, in the old Mary Jane books where they would have like flashbacks to her high school life, like Parallel Lives or Untold Tales 16. They would always have scenes like this where the guys would be like, come on, Red, which one of us are you going to choose? Later, Tigers. I'll figure it out later. Oh, Red. There's a scene just like this in Parallel Lives. I, I, I've seen other scenes like what you're talking about, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for some reason there's lockers at ESU. Um, have, have you ever guys have you guys ever been to a college with lockers? 
For some reason, there's a college in like like the hallway <laughs> of the building in my Spanish class, but no one uses them. I, I never even thought of that. <laughs> yeah, it's like my university's library has some small lockers, but it's more like to keep a small amount of things you don't want to carry around with you all day. Like if you have 16 books for your class, you can leave some. Of it. But again, it's it's not something that's used a whole lot. What's up with oh. Harry Osborn with his pants way above his belly button? <laughs> I mean, it looks like oh, like an eighty year old man with a it's bow tie and his pants so high. It's Harry Urkel. Oh, did I? Did the goblin do that? <laughs> <laughs> Dang. So Gwen's at her locker, wondering why she has one in college, and also wondering <laughs> why, and also wondering. It's strange. Peter Parker is the only boy who hasn't paid any attention to me. Oh, my book. As Peter sees her drop her book, like, dramatically in slow motion, Spider-Man 1-style cafeteria scene. Well, well, at last, I've got a chance to be a hero without turning into Spider-Man. Okay, dude, calm down. It's a falling book. Allow <laughs> me. It's kind of like Amazing Spider-Man. I know. It's like, oh, you know, if I, if I, if, if I catch get this it. book for her. <laughs> no, falling sails. Get it? No, okay, sorry. Yeah, oh. when the book falls, he's like, no, I can't let it fall. Not like when. <laughs> In the future, <laughs> it's it's like yeah. foreshadowing. Oh no, the spine of the book broke during the fall. You hear oh, well. snap. <laughs> and look, there's an Osborne on the scene. It's perfect. Oh God, this pale above his nipples. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's great is that she's like, I wish Peter would not. I wish Peter would pay attention to me. And then Peter comes up. She's like, Don't pay attention to me. He oh, tries to grab course. the book, but she like. Cock blocks him with her foot, like. Stop, stop. <laughs> oh, Allow me, fair maiden. You don't you dare touch my book, huh? Look, I don't get it. What gives? And then Harry Osborne, eighty-year-old man. Huh, do we have to spell it out for you? You're as popular as as Mao Zedong. You tell him, Harry boy. I agree with Liz. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Culture reference here, Mao Zedong. For those in the audience who don't know. He was the leader of communist China in the 50s, 60s, and most of the 70s. So right here in 1965, in the middle of the Cold War, he was, you know, one of the bad guy names of the universe, of, of the Earth at the time. And Peter's um, um, apparently in his league since they're comparing... Here's a uh, spider question, or continuity question. It seems like Ditko likes to draw Gwen with uh, barrettes in her, or something in her hair in the front end. When did she get that barrette that goes over the center of her hair that you always see? Right? Last, last? Um, it was oh, you did? issue 41, I want to say. 41, fact, okay. Hold on. I'm going to, uh, yeah, I believe that she, she didn't get it until like very early in the Ramita run. I'm looking like at a like headband, you mean? Yeah. yeah, like that infamous headband she always has. We were talking about this a little bit uh, uh, at the first half of the issue with Scott that. Did, that Ramita took Gwen's look on a journey. Mm-hmm. Like he starts out very much like uh, Ditko's appearance of Gwen, but then he adds the headband, and over time he changes the face and the hair, so that the Gwen Stacy of this of the issue sixties looks nothing like the Gwen Stacy right. of issue thirty eight, thirty nine, forty. Well, these these things are hair make her look like a like a really young girl, like a high school student. She doesn't look like a college no. girl at all. And it's Peter's forty one, wa- it's forty two. We okay. mentioned that uh, Peter's wardrobe has changed from high school to college. So you think that like like whatever Gwen dressed like in high school, it would be more mature looking now. She probably had, like pigtails in in high school or whatever. Well, you see her in high school in Untold Tales, like uh, I know you're gonna say that. of her and Harry, and I mean she basically looks like a softer version of what you're seeing here. Like she has the same haircut and the same look. No, I, I, you know, I, I've actually seen her in Untold Tales, but I, I figure like I don't know, like maybe, maybe like like when she wasn't looking like that, <laughs> she looks something else. I don't know. Well, she was a beauty queen. I doubt she wore pigtails because beauty queens don't really do that. You've been snubbing us since school started, walking around here like a swell-headed snob just because you want a scholarship. Well, that's okay with us, but don't think you can become one of the crowd anytime you feel like it. Now I get it. When I was worried about Aunt May wrapped up in my own problems, they thought I was hi-hatting them. Yes. That old Parker Luck sure running through the form. First appearance, Parker what Luck. Really? Seriously, yeah. this is the Parker Luck first appearance? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like, like that phrase. Wow. Yuck, 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 that Parker luck. So they trying to make Harry into the college flash, you think, here? He, he I wa- think so. 
He yeah. was like in thirty in thirty one, like when saying <laughs> you're reminding me of Flash Thompson. It's like yeah. you've known Harry for years. You've known Flash for two hours, and you're like you're reminding me of Flash Thompson. Right. So Peter decides that they're all jerks and he doesn't care and he doesn't have to explain to them. But uh, Gwen has her own thoughts about it when Harry says, I guess we told that egghead where to get off, eh, Gwen? I guess so, Harry. But I wonder why I feel a bit ashamed of myself. After all, he has cold-shouldered all of us ever since he came to ESU. And yet, perhaps he had a reason. Perhaps we just don't understand. Perhaps he did, stupid. I, I think I see an error in that first panel. That's a thought balloon by Gwen. It doesn't actually seem like she's talking to Harry. Yeah. Oh, well, she, she's thinking, I, maybe she's thinking, I yeah. guess so, Harry. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps he had a reason. Perhaps we just don't understand. But he couldn't care less. Look at him bending over those test tubes. <laughs> he doesn't even know I exist. Well, wow. Peter Parker just... How are we supposed I mean, to like this chick, man? I love I how Peter is only an okay be. human being if he's attracted to Gwen. Well, he's yeah. like... Peter's doing nothing but looking at his test tubes, and Gwen goes through, like, five stages of emotion. She's like, oh, she's probably all right, Peter. What? He's not even turning around! Wow. Die, Peter Parker! Die. <laughs> this is like Betty Brant with a, a blonde wig, man. This chick is crazy, too. Pretty bad, bro. And then Peter's thinking, that Gwen is a knockout, if only, ah, oh, what's the use? <laughs> Little does he know that she's, like, planning his death. She probably hired Craven to come to America. More so, women hiring villains. What's up with this lack of responsibility in this middle? These three middle panels. Yeah, yeah we <laughs> That's were going to talk about total lack of responsibility there. Brand Peter. new day, you know, fifty years beforehand. Yeah, because after class, Peter sees the police rush to a crime scene. Time for Spidey action. Am I right? Ah, nope, screw it. I gotta go I'm study. Not... <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apparently, he's decided that he already has enough money from Jonah's last set of pictures, so it doesn't matter. Man, yeah. some some family member ought to die in the next panel from that. <laughs> Betty Brant and Aunt May were just murdered. <laughs> <laughs> they got better. <laughs> yeah, so Peter decides. Yeah, I, I I don't need to. I don't need any crime pictures, and I don't need to solve this crime. Let the police. Jeez. It's it's, it's weird. So it's such a non sequitur. So Craven arrives at an old hideout of the Chameleons. Craven does doesn't care what happened to Chameleon. You know, his secret brother. As long as he stays away during his plan. <laughs> He talks to himself for hours. Seriously, he talks to himself for hours. Read the caption box. And decides he knows how to trap Spider-Man. And we get an interlude of Aunt May trying to fatten up Peter, saying that he needs a hobby. She's like, There's so much Aunt May crap in this issue. Oh, like, maybe, I've read some of this. Maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm mixing them up a little bit. But there's so much. Oh, no, don't care. worry. Like, you know, it's like, it's like be careful. You know, breathe too fast and die instantly. Some crap like and he that. talks, Peter, you need a hobby. Like, oh, she's like, a she's like fattening him up, yeah. I know. Look at his cheeks. He looks like a chipmunk with that milk and cake in there. Oh. That's a very cartoony uh, picture. Yeah. Yeah. Now, she says that, you know, why don't you have a hobby? And he's like, it just happens that I do have a little hobby. What would he have said if she's like, oh, like what? Uh, uh, taking pictures? I don't know. Betty Brand. Mess- messing with test tubes. Harry Palms. <laughs> There's a euphemism. Yeah. I like how... Um, Stan needs to apologize for the panels that don't really have any action. He does it in the, twice on this page. Panel four, he says, we'll admit this has been a pretty long introduction. But once the action gets started, it'll be more than make up for it. So bear with us a short time longer. And then last panel, okay, web spinners, you've been patient with us till now. And here's where it starts paying off. It's like, he, did, he doesn't he did. seem to understand that like the, the parts of the story that aren't necessarily a superhero fight... Those are the best parts of the story. He's so cute in his naivete here. He did, he did the exact same thing in this. I, I, I can't remember what issue it was, but he did the exact same thing where he was like, okay, just a little longer. Don't worry now. And then now we're into the action. Like, he, he's, he's, it's, it's a total Stan, Stan Lee repeat. And the, the uh, suit that Jameson is in, it reminds me of the goblin suit where his mask was. You know, in Amazing 14, where you see a, a green suit walking away with his face mm-hmm. hidden. Mm-hmm. Well, it just kind of yeah. reminds me of it. All right. And um, backing up just a little bit. The Craven scheming in his house. He uh, is like, I've got to trap Spider-Man before I myself am discovered and talking about all these things. It's like, I'm thinking about Chameleon. When he first mentioned this guy, he was saying, there's no one foolhardy enough to go after Spider-Man. <gasps> Wait a minute. What about my old friend Craven? 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, obviously this guy is psycho enough to not only help Cammy go after Spider-Man, but also to hold a grudge for freaking ever when he loses. And just trying <laughs> to imagine what this kid was like on the playground. I imagine him with a sort of like stewy like mentality from Family Guy determined to utterly destroy anyone who ever makes him look bad on the playground. You beat me in tag years ago. Now who's the faster runner? You cut off my legs. Why? Ha ha ha. Only Craven would run faster. <laughs> he, says he, he wants to destroy the one I loathe the most in all the world. I must find a way to make him want to fight me. It's just like every villain's like that. You've met him twice. Once was part of the other guy's plan, and and now he's the one you loathe most in all the world. Well, in fairness, it makes sense with Craven because oh. Craven's always like wants to be the best. And be undefeatable, so it makes sense with him, and it, it doesn't make sense with like. I was trying undefeatable. to think the second appearance. You're you're referencing the annual number one, aren't you? Yeah, the Sinister Six annual. Yeah, it, really, he had a very minor part to play in that. Yeah. I mean, he was one of the least used villains in that story. Right. Didn't he get arrested at the end of that one too? Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. He was deported at the end of um 15. at the end of fifteen, yeah. and he was arrested. But then he swam swam right back, and it tells a suspense issue. <laughs> and then he was arrested in issue uh, annual number one. And he's arrested at this one, but we're jumping ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he loses in this issue? Anyways, where, where, where are we, Josh? Well, Spider-Man attacks Jonah in the streets in front of a crowd, but retreats before any damage can be done. Or does he? <laughs> As Spidey flees, he takes off his mask to reveal he's Craven the Hunter. Like brother? Like brother. He impersonated Spider-Man <laughs> just like his secret brother, the chameleon. Oh, yeah. Secret brother. Secret brother from a different mother. But what, wah, wah, wah. Real, <laughs> but what of the real Spider-Man? Here he is, the world's most amazing hero, contently munching a Macintosh app. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. I saw that. When I, I saw that too. I was like, "What?" That was a real thing before Mac and Wow. That's why it's called a Macintosh. <laughs> it's named like, after the fruit. It, 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 in the <laughs> In the, in the like in the Marvel Masterworks reprint, Peter actually has like a Macintosh computer and he's tuning on it. It's an ed- ed- edible <laughs> laptop. It's from the year 2072. They have edible computers. Contently munching on a Macintosh apple as he and his aunt catch up on the day's news. Did you remember to wash that apple before eating it, Peter dear? Sure, Aunt May. You know I'm not the type to live dangerously. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, He's not oh, the type no. to live dangerously. Wow. When <laughs> I read that, that, that just amazed me. I'm like, this has got to be a 90-year-old woman in this panel. He, he, he lives dangerously all the time on a day-to-day basis. He's lying to his teeth, to his aunt. Wow. And, of course, then the exposition news comes on and talks about how um, Spider-Man attacked J. Jonah Jameson, courageous publisher of the Daily Bugle, as Peter goes, <laughs> yep. Peter, what's wrong, dear? Nothing, Aunt May. I must have bit my tongue. <laughs> sure, wanna. So Peter actually decides once again, for the second time this issue, to ignore the problem, just like yeah. the other robbery. He says the impersonator probably won't do any harm to his name. I mean, somebody wearing a the, Spider-Man costume attacking him. There's like a mini-day montage. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't exactly. It continues for days, according to the montage, much to Peter's annoyance and Jonah's delight, you know, because it's selling papers. Okay, a couple of things about this, though. Okay, first of all, the first panel. Just when everything seemed nice and peaceful, now this. I know I didn't see Jameson tonight, and that means just one thing. Someone's impersonating me. I know where you're going why? with this. And obviously he should know that it means someone's impersonating him because he learned that lesson in issue 13. What I want to know is why didn't his spider sense go off? Because as we all know from the Avengers number 11, his spider sense can tell him when someone's dressing up as Spider-Man. Oh. <laughs> I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to say, um, why, why, has, why, has, why is Peter like, freaking out says, I don't remember doing that, but I must have. I'm right there. I must be going crazy. I thought you were going like, to pull that. Well, no, because he, he, he learned that issue. I mean, he learned in issue 13 that when, that when he sees Spider-Man on TV, it's, he's not going crazy. We had we had to actually learn that lesson though, but also the whole J- uh, Craven uh, dressing up as Spider Man and chasing after Jonah. One of the annoying tropes of comics is that since it's a silent medium, characters are almost never able to discern each other's voices. Jameson has seen Spider Man innumerable times, and he knows Spider Man's voice, and he knows that Craven does not have the same voice. But this happens all accents. the time, like. 
you, you might have it happen occasionally, but so often one person dresses like another to pretend and no one else can tell. It's like Superman and Batman. They swap clothes and no one realizes because they look and sound exactly the same. I, I, I don't know. It bothers it's me. Like, it's <laughs> like in the first Puppet Master story. Um, the Puppet Master gives Alicia a haircut and dyes her hair. And not even Sue's own fiance and brother can tell that it's not really Sue. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because it's like, you look just like Susan Storm. I will make you, you know, go and masquerade as her, which is funny because later on, Susan Storm's brother, like, starts boinking this girl that looks just like his sister. <laughs> yeah, but don't worry, it was an alien. But don't worry, it was an alien. Before we move on, do you, you, that last panel where he's eating the Macintosh apple, does that bite out of the <laughs> apple not look exactly like the apple logo? It really does. <laughs> I mean, exactly. This exactly like the same. Star Stan- Trek, Apple, the Craven's Last Hunt. This Stan issue is owed some money. I know this issue like spawn. This like this ordinary issue turns out to be like foreshadowing for a million. And that years. that uh, page eight, that bottom right panel where he's looking at the television with the bite of the apple. He has a sixth finger there too. By the way, do you see that on the left uh, on the left hand? Uh, I, I see where you're getting. You got it, an yeah. extra pinky. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> yep. And uh, Michael Bailey will be sad to know that on the next page there's an ad where Pac-Man's dad comes back to haunt us, <laughs> encouraging kids to start their own business, electrical appliance repairing. The horrible, horrible. It continues for days, much to Peter's annoyance and Jonah's delight, because it's selling papers. Peter walks past an angry group of Dicko talking heads who each say. <laughs> <laughs> He'd say their piece about it and then goes to class where an angry Glenn, Gwen glares at Peter as Peter yeah. realizes he must do something about – no, as Peter realizes maybe he should do something about the guy impersonating him. Because it's remember. been days. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I'll do something about it. Maybe. I, I, uh, uh, this is uh... – And like as Gwen's staring at you, got to wonder what's going through her head. I'm guessing it's something along the lines of Peter's ignoring us, but I think he's not that bad. In fact – He's probably – oh, look at him staring at those textbooks. I'll burn ESU down if he doesn't flirt with me. <laughs> <laughs> so out goes Crazy Betty. In comes Crazy Liz. Thank no, you no, very no. much. Crazy Gwen. Oh, oh, Crazy Gwen. I'm sorry. In comes Thanks. like bipolar Gwen. That's why now, we're talking about Mary talking. Jane. She's the only sane one. Mary She's Jane, the only yeah. sane one. Pierce my ears and call me drafty. Check oh, out that far-out hole in the wall, gang. It's like – an air conditioning, but bigger. <laughs> what is? It, what are you quoting? On uh, various issues of Mary Jane dialogue. Dude, she's she's still the only sane one he ever met. <laughs> well, sane I mean, woman anyway. With Gwen, it's like you know, I love you. So why do I want to kill you? Or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to save you, why must I cut you open and gut you? Slowly? <laughs> I was, I was oh, gonna say, has, has anybody has anybody seen the movie Hard Candy with uh, Ellen Page? No, but I would love to see Ellen Page do anything. <laughs> yeah, if you talking about Kitty Pride? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking Emma Stone. Wow. Ellen Page, she's cute too, but I don't think she's old enough for me to say that out loud. Nope. Or on a, or on a podcast oh, over a million too. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to that talking head scene, because he's walking through the crowd, and you know, I can imagine that whatever good reputation Spider-Man might have at this time is just getting shredded by all of Craven's antics as Spider-Man. And I have to wonder, why did Peter wait days? I mean, fake Spider-Man shows up. He says, huh, I don't know what this is. Maybe it'll blow over. Maybe the police will catch him. I'll wait. But I would say that the he's next a- time he shows up, I would have gone after him if I had been Peter. But no. But he, he walked away from the the ambulance or the, the police siren going away, too, in this issue. That's a double whammy. It's yeah, just like that scene from Spider-Man Two where he sees. That well, he guy, tried to go there then. He sees that guy getting like a beating, getting beat to death. And I like, know. <laughs> it's just out of and character if, after. If, 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 if you rewatch that scene, like they're not, they're not, they're not actually hurting him that bad. Like, like ever since I saw that movie, I'm like, I, I, I pay attention. Like they're just like throwing him around. But uh, I mean, we we know the reason that 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 Steve Ditko just you know was messing around and Stanley just had to confusedly write this. But yeah, like Peter, Peter's like the laziest dude ever in this issue. Yep. Horrible, horrible man. He needs to, like, go help Aunt May, you know, like, clean out the backyard and have some little kid give Buy him some new hats. Yeah, get, get, have some <laughs> little kid give him a guilt strip, like, in Spider- What? When is Spider-Man gonna come back? 
Peter can't do anything, though, because leaving Aunt May alone would be so horrible. Luckily, Anna Watson comes over because she feels like a good old-fashioned chat. That's actually what she says. Oh, I think we should have a good old-fashioned chat. I think that that's code, though, for a secret introduce Peter to Mary Jane meeting. <laughs> it's like uh, Robbie Robertson and uh, Captain Stacy later on. Their secret meetings to find out who Spider-Man is. It's like this one with Mary Jane and Peter. It's, it's like, odd to see Peter's thought balloon of Mrs. Watson for once I'm getting lucky. Oh, wow. No. I mean, uh, come on now. Oh, I, I was to <laughs> and then look, look at his face. He's like, yeah, yeah. For <laughs> once, I'm getting <laughs> lucky. <laughs> Mrs. Hey, Mrs. Watson has lost some weight from, you know, her Yeah, she's looking here. fine. She's a gilf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. no. Like, like, this needs his own de- demotivational poster. Mrs. Watson, for once, I'm getting lucky. Mrs. Watson, gilf. And then look at Aunt May's caption. So do I, Anna. I've got the tastiest cookies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Waka, 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 waka. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> See, it's waka, waka. Nom, 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 The tea will be ready in no time. The tea. <laughs> yeah, so Peter tells them that he's going to see a scary movie, to which I have to ask, why would you tell Aunt May that? You know that, like, if you tell her that you're going to go outside without a raincoat, she'll, like, have another heart attack. You know, and like she doesn't like the way that you eat apples unless you wash them. You're gonna tell this woman that you're gonna see a scary movie, really? I've never heard, heard the phrase. It's gonna be a chin fest. What? What's a chin fest? Um, uh, oh, we don't know. It's the 60s yeah. turn around now. A chin fest. Uh, they're they're gonna be gabbing, wagging their chins. Uh, oh, okay. So, so, so Aunt May's like, oh, I hope that those films don't give you nightmares. And then Anna Watson says, that's what I always tell Mary Jane. Don't encourage her, Anna. It's like, oh no, they said Mary Jane, I have to get out of here. Ooh, so thank goodness around. for Mrs. Watson. So swinging around as Spidey, he catches his impersonator, and before someone can say Clone Saga, the chase is on. Craven, <laughs> 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 nice. nice. Yeah. Craven sheds his disguise out of nowhere, like literally. He's like he's not in the costume anymore. Okay. And he sprays Spider Man with jungle gas to cancel out his spider sense. <laughs> I've had a bit of jungle gas myself. <laughs> uh, jungle juice. <laughs> so, so, so while Spider-Man's getting high on jungle gas, Craven gives his <laughs> exposition. He's like, "I vow revenge for my last defeat, but if you win, I'll confess to my crimes." That wasn't very Russian. That like isn't that, Snoop, off... isn't that a Snoop Dogg song? Sipping on gin and jungle juice, laid back. <laughs> I got my mind on my spider. My spider on my mind. <laughs> oh yes. Sorry. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Bertone. Yeah. The fight continues throughout an abandoned building with Snoop Dogg, where some criminals saw Spidey and they've entered the fray to snuff him out themselves, which it's kind of a non sequitur. I think that Dicko drew them in and Stanley's like, ah, uh, so some criminals saw Spidey. Peter webs up the non sequitur gang and avoids some of Craven's traps in this abandoned building. Apparently, the jungle gas only dulled his spider sense and it starts to return. Okay, sure. Just in time for Spider-Man to recover from an almost surprise attack from Kraven. More criminals come, and Spider-Man continues to avoid Kraven. It's a big old madhouse. But he finally gets Kraven down the hand-to-hand combat, where Spider-Man bests Kraven and webs him up along with the random non-sequitur gang. Spider-Man decides not to take pictures of the capture for money because it means that he'd have to see Betty again. Yeah, this woman is so crazy that he'd rather be broke than to, like, see her for, like, ten minutes. This is, like, the second time that, like, maybe that, and, I mean, you can kind of infer that maybe that's why he didn't take those pictures at the beginning of the issue. Not because of great power, great responsibility, because he didn't want to see Betty again. Wow. Could be, yeah. So, Craven's the man of his honor. He confesses everything. Jonah isn't happy when he's informed of this. Craven even gives the cops a demonstration. Which we don't see. They just say, Keevan gave them a demonstration, which proved everything. Like, how did they do that? It's like, all right, Craven, show us how I put the Spider-Man costume on and show us how you web swings. Oh, he got away. We shouldn't have given them that demonstration. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Jameson. I finished all the day's correspondence. Will there be anything else? No, that's all. You think I run a sweatshop here? Go on home and be here at night sharp tomorrow. Oh, does that mean... Yes, you're hired. The job of replacing Betty Brandt is yours. <laughs> I wonder, like, <laughs> replacing Betty Brandt, like, what are those requirements? Like, extreme bitchiness, <laughs> hypocrisy. I'd love to see the classified ad. Need a yeah. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's where Jimmy says, you know, nights at the This is wonderful. 
wonderful. Imagine, I'm the personal secretary and the publisher of the Daily Bugle. But I never thought that Betty Brant would leave. It happened so suddenly. I wonder what happened. Do we That's ever so see me. that character again? This this lowest. Actually, player? I have a note about that. Uh, I'll say it after after you guys finish the recap. He he goes through like a chain of secretaries until Betty returns. It becomes a running joke. But I I think that this one shows up again. But you oh, get okay. the impression that like she's been at the bugle for a while because she's like, oh, this is wonderful. I'm like head secretary and. She talks about Betty Brandt leaving as if she knows who Betty Brandt is. Which I, know, I was about to say, it's Betty Brandt's celebrity. Because was, it's, it's like you said, uh, Josh, like Betty Brandt is the teenage secretary of like a huge publicity mogul. So I, I, at first, it sounds like she's reacting to that. But then she's like, oh, the legendary is gone. So what now? What's going to happen? It's weird. I feel like it's like in a reality situation, Jonah wouldn't be saying the job of replacing Betty Brandt is yours. Because I've never been in a position where I've been told – whom I'm replacing. And <laughs> of course you haven't. <laughs> it's just like, you know, the job of replacing, you know. The dude I fired is yours. Right. And, I mean, I, I would say that it's unprofessional of Jonah, but calling Jonah unprofessional is like calling water wet. So um, I'm not going to worry about that. It, just, it seems awkward to me. Yeah, because Jonah's the unprofessional one, you know, not the one who abandoned their super responsible, <laughs> like, they're their super hard job that has lots of responsibilities to the news corporation, you know, without giving any notice because you couldn't make up your mind about which fella you loved more. So you had to leave your whole job. You know, like no, that. but he is the one who publishes news and is responsible to the federal regulations governing that. And he makes up news to fit his own you know, agenda to discredit costume superheroes. Um. Okay, but Betty, um, <laughs> Betty yells at Peter for for for, for walking Liz home. <laughs> and then, 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 Jonah's then that, breaking the law and FCC regulations, and Betty yells at Peter. <laughs> Betty cheated on her husband with, with 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 a fugitive. Okay, and then told him that he didn't care about their marriage. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, Jameson smokes. <laughs> Jameson hired killer robots to murder Spider. Exactly. He mutated uh, a, a private dick too. Become a Whoa. scorpion. We've been oh, on yeah. the Betty Brand train. We should have been on the Jonah train this whole time. This guy's a bad human being. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was apparent. I, I, yeah. I think we need to analyze that pretty much. Yeah, it, it, it's not. Yeah. Wait. So Peter goes home on the last page where the two girls are having their old fashioned chat. As I was telling my niece Mary Jane, oh, hello, Peter. <laughs> I'm glad. And then, yeah, my Aunt May voice and my Anna Watson voice were the same. So now I'm Aunt May. I'm glad you came home early, dear. Did you enjoy the movie? Huh? Oh, oh no. Um, I can't honestly say I did. <laughs> get it? Get it? Because he didn't see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll go upstairs and do some more studying now. Been nice seeing you, Mrs. <laughs> 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 Feeling lucky, Mrs. Watson. <laughs> and and she's Mrs. so happy. Face. She's like, I, you could like, edit this is like a movie trailer. <laughs> but but look at yeah, her really she, She's so happy that he's not a wild rowdy like so many others. Obviously, she's had some experience here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Don't tire yourself out, Peter. You know how fragile you are. And then Anna Watson's like, I'd like to figure out how fragile he is. I want Such three rounds nice... with Tony Stark back in the fifties. <laughs> Uh, Such a nice stuff, I mean. boy, not wild and rowdy like so many others. <laughs> He's like signaling her, meet me upstairs. <laughs> hey. Wow, we're looking at oh. a whole new uh, bit of Anna Watson here. <laughs> well, Peter is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Peter goes to the room of angst and science. Where he- <laughs> that's a, that is now, as it now shall that's always funny. be known as. The yeah. angst. <laughs> the room <laughs> The room of angst and science. Oh, Am I God. really being a coward? Is it that I'm afraid to face Betty? Um, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> afraid to tell her the truth? <laughs> Am I afraid of her reaction when she learns of the secret I've kept from her all these years? No, this is no good. It's useless. I've got to learn to accept things as they are. I've got to stop thinking of Betty. To me, it must be as though she doesn't exist. It's the only way, because she never accepted me as Spider-Man. And that, that panel right there that you, you just referenced, does the shadows of the curtains, doesn't it look like it's giving him, him Osborne hair? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. It's doesn't it look like Osborne hair? <laughs> He's a clone of Norman Osborne. <laughs> <laughs> but Spider-Man I've been and always be for as long as I live. Oh, and that actually comes up in, like, the, is it the next issue? Or no, it's, it's, it's like, I think it's an issue, a couple issues later when 
someone hits on him and he's like, oh, I, this this is going to happen again with uh, Betty. I can't let it happen again. No, somebody hits on him and um, he says, wait a second, she just loves me for my brain. Oh, no, I better get rid of her. Like, he literally says, I, I can't talk to Sally Green. She just loves me for my brain. I can't right. have another Betty Brant on my hands. Well, I, I, I kind of I kinda understood how I was going with that. Just a little bit. Just a very little bit. Also, if have- you look, Ditko started something with uh, the previous issue and this issue. In, in, the, in the past, they used to do coming up next issue. It used to just be word captions. And now he's doing full-on art, kind of previewing it. He's making a whole panel. Next, so the Molten Man returns. The, the Molten Man. Because we needed right. him to come back. Seriously. And, Which and, is you know, Liz Allen's brother, right? Yep. Stepbrother. Yeah. Stepbrother, that's right. And there is a hypno coin right there. <laughs> All right, awesome story here, Bertone. Um, going back and looking at the fight for a second, I had a couple of things I wanted to say here. On page 12, in the fourth panel, after he's lost Craven and is creeping down into the building from the roof, he says, I'd better be careful. He's had all the time in the world to set every kind of unexpected trap for me. And I'm just thinking, yeah, I, I realize it's one of those hindsight is twenty twenty moments when you probably wish that you hadn't waited days before going after the guy who was impersonating you. <laughs> and um, I liked on page 13, he says, there isn't a trap made that can stop me from doing what I have to do. At least... I'm hoping there isn't. He's feeling very confident after escaping from the wreck last issue. I, I kind of like that. And, oh, uh, yeah, 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 like the underwater thing. Yeah. You know, he had that great victory. Even though Dr. Octopus got away, he still went from the bottoms of the river to saving his Aunt May's life. And now it's like, there's no trap on Earth that can stop me. And at the very bottom of the page, the first panel of the last row, he says, Sorry, gents, this is a private party. It's him! You mean it is he... And my inner grammar Nazi just, you know, cried with happiness there whenever he said Actually. That. We have on page 17, the uh, first panel on that page is a parallel to the cover image. And yep. if I've never said it, I really like when the cover is taken from a scene in the book. This almost never happens these days. I don't know when the last time was that I saw a cover that was actually a scene in the book. Usually it's similar thematically to the overall idea of the story. Or, you know, just an iconic okay. image of the characters. It's never actually a scene from the story, and I really like when they do that. What other thoughts do we have on this issue? I, Craven's back. I got, before we go to Craven, I, I got one. I, I said I had a note about, like, the new secretary. And it connects to a note I have back when um, uh, Craven first met us J.J. James and Justice Spider-Man. Th- these are both reenacted. These are both referenced in uh, Marvel's Kirby Biasek uh, and Alice Ross's uh, four-issue miniseries. Because... This, they, like because Marvel's stunt was that um that 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 miniseries was that they would actually use like actual scenes from various Marvel issues to coincide chronologically with the times and they actually like you know like I think it was a win the public was growing unsettled with super uh, at the beginning you see like you see like one panel that references and this is that same dialogue it's uh where Jameson says it's it's more says um somebody call the police Spider Man is assaulting Jonah Jameson ha ah! I always, I always knew you were yellow. I was scared you were like that. That is done. It's a different angle, but it's re, it's reinterpreted by Alex Ross. And then a, either later that issue or around that issue that uh, Marvels, you see this uh, new secretary in the Daily Beagle. Yeah. Norman Osborn's behind this all, by the way. Norman Osborn's behind it all. <laughs> no, he is. Oh, tell me, you're kidding me? No. He, Are um, we talking about chapter one? No, I, I say I say no, in, in defiance of him being involved. Okay, well, I say look at issue 49 of Amazing. Oh, oh, oh that's, that, that, that is right. You're absolutely right. Damn you. Re- refresh me. I haven't read that one in a long time. What, oh, how is on. he behind it? it? It might not be 49. Let me look a few issues back. It's, it's one of those things. Uh, I think it's, it's 49. Of, it, it's 47. What happens with 47? Um, it turns out that the Green Goblin like hired Craven to go after Spider-Man. To F uh-huh. this way. Which doesn't really fit in with this, and uh, Osborne decided not to give him all the money. So later on that issue, like Craven decides to go after Osborne again. He jumps as the butler. Yeah, 
Okay, okay, now now let's look at this, okay, because we've had some issues about uh, retcons and how big they work recently. Um, oh, God. Okay, I'm just looking at his opening when he, like, is stating his motivations and everything. I can endure the frustration no longer. I must battle and defeat my greatest mortal enemy, or else everything that has gone before is but a hollow mockery. So, if Norman paid him, he obviously has enough internal motivation to make it worthwhile. Yeah... Okay, I'm 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 looking at the first few pages of issue 47, and like you see the fight that they're had that Craven and Spider Man are having, and the Green Goblin is flying like just over them. Ha! Yeah. Spider Man thinks Craven is fighting him just for the sheer love of battle, but little does the web slinging <laughs> fool realize that the Green Goblin has promised to pay the hunter twenty thousand dollars for the death of Spider Man. That's also and a it, reference. In, uh, yeah. Is it? Is it? Uh, no, that's another thing. Never mind. Or was, yeah, wait, Spider-Man Blue, because Griffin was a big bad Spider-Man Blue, was it? And, or, no, but that was, that was one of the Mormita era, not the Sticko era. Even as they thought, Craven was obsessed with the thought of $20,000 he had been promised, that he could barely concentrate on the matter at hand. And then, like, Craven's fighting Spider-Man, and he's, like, looking at the goblin. He's watching. He sees me winning. The money is as good as mine. But now Spider-Man is raising himself up. I didn't think he had the strength. And then you see him going to the goblin, demanding the first half of the money, and the goblin saying no. And he says, I'll do more than tell him. After the gr- Oh, no, he's going to Osborne, because he doesn't know that Osborne and Goblin are different people. He thinks that Osborne's an emissary for the goblin. Mm-hmm. So, like, but, yeah, we'll get to that when we talk about issue 47. But, yeah, it, it's a big retcon. That's interesting. It's one of the first retcons. Like, is, is, that, is that the first retcon chronologically in Spider-Man public history? Uh, yeah, it might be. Uh, oh, wait, hold on a second. This doesn't make sense. Oh, no. <laughs> Bertone's Bertone brain is gone. Okay, because basically he's having the fight with Craven, and then, like, Spider-Man, like, something happens and Spider-Man gets away. So Craven yells at Osborne, like, give me the rest of the money, and he's like, no, not until you defeat him. So then he fights Spider-Man again, and Spider-Man webs him up, like, at the end of this issue. But mm-hmm. they only had one fight in this issue. Oh. oh. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work. Oh, Ooh, sins, oh wow, that's like the, the, it's it's sins past right there, Brad. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that. Put it in the put it in the comment. Yeah. So basically, I don't unless it, it doesn't work. But okay, sure. Osborne was behind this all. It's a retcon and it's a Stanley retcon. I wouldn't say it's the worst, the first retcon in Spider-Man history because we've had little retcons like who owns the Parker House and last what name. Is, oh, well, okay. Are retcons just stuff that's been changed, or retcons classified as like stuff that like legitimately was changed later? Because like that's an inconsistency. Going back and adding to a previous story to make it different, I would say is a retcon. Yeah. Oh no! Don't do this right now. <laughs> oh no! No no. Yeah, no! 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 Let's move on, please. <laughs> we're, we're sitting on dynamite right now. My, my eyes are already turning green. My hair is already turning blonde. <laughs> okay. So the trophy head in the very second page that he wants to put the Spider-Man mask on, I guess he got that from the chameleons since, you know, they're secretly yeah. brothers and everything. Well, about I don't know. that thing that he wants to put the mask on, why doesn't he just want Spider-Man's head, aside the fact that this is a comic code comic? But he has, <laughs> like, he has, like, stuffed, you know, uh, taxidermid animals, like, where he, like, has their corpses around his house. But for Spider-Man, he just wants the mask, not the head. Really? I think taxidermists have a policy against doing humans. He's he Craven want, the Hunter. He wants what they showed in the Grim Hunt. They want his body up on the wall. Is what he wants. <laughs> he wants to crucify him like a Roman. Exactly. For absolutely no reason. Uh, we get more indication here, like before the eventual retcon, that they don't live together. That Anna Watson and Mary Jane do live together. Like Anna, Anna's really obsessed with Mary Jane. Well, it's, it's also a way of just, like, keeping the name out there, reminding you that this is going on, that she's there, because we've had a big shakeup in Peter's uh, girl life. You know, Betty is leaving, Liz is gone, Gwen doesn't like him, and oh yeah, there's Mary Jane. It, it's just it's interesting that, like, Anna Watson talks about Mary Jane, like, she's the child that she has at home. I mean, but it, it's a retcon that they don't live together. It was generally assumed that they did before this. So, I actually, I really liked this issue. Uh, I did too. I don't know how y'all feel about it. I thought this this was a better performance on Craven's part, as opposed to the uh, magnetic bracelets of issue 15 that we had before. What the heck? <laughs> In 1965 has been a really big year with lots of mythology building as far as his relationships with the girls we were just talking about. Uh, he went from high school to college. There was the epic multi-part stories. And it felt like this was a return to classic. Like you it, know what? 
uh, I'll be honest with you. This starts a, a, a string of maybe like three or four issues where I'm not. I'm actually not that crazy about. Okay. And, uh, you didn't like it. It's not. I don't want to say I didn't like it. Uh, it's an enjoyable issue, but like the super superhero stuff, I really just kind of see it as like padding, and and it, it's it's what the people you know want to see, especially back in these times. Like, it's, there's nothing really wrong with it. But personally, I honestly felt that like this fight, like I, I keep on forgetting that this is the one where Craven dresses up as Spider Man for the first out of five times. And like like the next fight with Multi Man, and then then it's like the looter. Like the super villains plots, I honestly forget every single time I read them, and I remember more about the uh, personal life stuff. Like 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 spoilers for next issue, the entire thing is a superhero fight, but at the very very end, it's like it's like you know a book into the whole Betty Brant subplot, and that's the only thing that I remember. And that's back back in issue thirty, I forgot about the cat, but I remember a whole Betty Brant uh, proposal thing. So it's like I don't I don't dislike these issues like whatsoever. It's not like I just it's not like I dislike them, but I think I think that it's not they're not I don't want to say they're bad but they're very unmemorable for me like every, almost every other Dicko issue is memorable but these the next three don't really they don't really stick out for me personally. Well, this is this is the time when Ditko and Lee didn't communicate. We've already talked about that on previous episodes. Um, Ditko's drawing the books and sending them in, so it's probably easier for him to draw more action oriented plots and less uh, character oriented plots. Because then he has to, you know, talk to Stan to explain what happened and why. And he's he's voicing like like Peter and Betty. But yeah, I I I do think that we're gonna see a, a decline in the quality because he's gonna go from plotting the book to not wanting to plot the book anymore. So he's just phoning it in. And I think you know we're gonna see that. But I didn't think I don't. To me, this issue was not yet the beginning of that. But. I mean, I, I still like. It. I, I, I like. I like. When, uh, when do you think it started? What issue did you, you think the fight started? I think oh. they've already been fighting. I, I don't think that they. I think the master planner was mm-hmm. plotted by Steve, and Stan had to figure it out. In mm-hmm. fact, he said as much in the Steve Ditko uh, documentary that I just Which watched recently. Me. The Jonathan Ross. So much. Mm-hmm. I would say that issue thirty, there was no communication because Stan. The, the the writing of issue 30 does not jive with the plot of issue 31. There's several problems with it as far as the, the master planner's gang. Because he calls them the cat's gang in issue 30 because Stan didn't know that they were going to be used in the next issue for something completely different. It, I, I've heard people uh, say a year. I've heard people say two years of them just not talking. But I would I would guess that if we go through the credits and see where it says plotted by Steve Ditko... When it starts saying that, that that's whenever the problem happened. Yeah, it's probably like one the, there was one issue where it says you know uh, uh, screwy Stan, or screwy Steve or whatever like really wanted to plot this issue, so Stan let him do it. And that was probably like, like the first thing of like Stan and them not talking maybe. Yeah, it know. could be that gang that showed up in the middle of the story. They just kind of come out of nowhere, and maybe Steve drew them thinking that they were Craven's gang or he had a different idea for them, but Stan didn't know. Because, again, I call them the non-sequitur gang because they just show up for no reason just to add, like, drama to the final fight. And it, it feels really off to me, like there was another purpose for them. Just like those scenes of Peter saying, oh, the cops, ah, who cares? I think that that was another thing, too, where Steve had a different idea. <laughs> Maybe if he went after that uh, siren, he would have stopped that gang. <laughs> Could be. Okay, I just looked through. Um, issue 26. The Man in the Crime Master's Mask, which is right after the big Mary Jane, Liz Allen, Betty Brant triangle debacle with the Spider Slayer. Um, the issue after that one, The Man in the Crime Master's Mask, Steve Ditko plotted that, and he's plotted every one since. So I oh, bet you... I have an idea. Go ahead, go ahead. I bet... Because we talked about that right around that time, because that is the one-year mark but uh, before he leaves the book. And that's usually what's touted as one year. You know, for the last year he was on the bookie and Stanley didn't talk. And yeah, he plotted every single one of those issues. And I bet you that they were not communicating. Okay, here's my thing. What if they agreed to reveal what Mary Jane looked like and Steve either disagreed and then like like Stan thought that he agreed or whatever. And Steve ended up doing the whole like whole gag with a flower. And then they had an argument over that, and that's when they started to stop talking. I mean, it's stupid, but it would be interesting. I don't think that they left the book over Mary Jane. Well, I mean, like, like not, not talk to each other. It's an interesting idea. We should call Steve up and ask him. Oh, wait, he won't <laughs> talk to us. That's Jonathan Ross. Um, if anyone out there has not read The Search for Steve Ditko, the documentary by Jonathan Ross, not on read. YouTube, it's free, it's an hour, it's well worth your time. It's an excellent documentary. You, you, you don't read yeah. documentaries. 
I remember when Brad had it on the crawlspace and I first saw it, and then like like hours later it was taken down. I know it was a YouTube thing I linked up. It was awesome. It was, it was awesome. What other thoughts do we have on this issue? Peter must have lost his mind when he was at the hospital and Aunt May said, it was just a silly old operation, where Peter's like, you know what? Silly old operation. I lifted half of a half a ton off of my back. Like several tons. Went, sold most of my stuff to a pawn shop to, to, <laughs> to buy a science thing for your op. No, no. Silly old operation. I almost killed my – forget this. Doctors, doctor, give me back the isotope. <laughs> Well, you, you know, you know, he probably, she probably like wondered, like, how did you pay for this and everything? She he probably wondered, why did Spider-Man bring science to save me? <laughs> <laughs> That's what horrible Spider-Man do. They they run around with carrying science. Um, I like that Peter doesn't. Uh, this is one of the lines that I like from the book. He says, um, "I guess I can't blame them for thinking them on the prize crumb of the year," referring to the ESU gang. But I sure don't intend to beg them for a chance to explain. See, like, if this was a different book or a different year, Peter would be like, wait, you guys don't understand. Let me explain. I like how he's like, you know what? <laughs> I don't even care that they don't know what really happened. Screw them. Yeah, that used to bother me when I was younger. Like, like just tell me, idiot. But, like, when I, you're right. I, I do like that. He's like, they, I don't care what people think of me. So he doesn't really – it never really bothers him. <laughs> yeah, well, it, because they're jerks. He's like, you know what? If they're going to act like that, you know, it, it's none of their business why, why I was acting like. So I like that. Well, moment of silence, because like I said, the last uh, Steve Ditko drawn Betty Brandt. I know, they're like, man. Because we have like the sad music montage. Who can forget the time when Betty Brandt yelled at Peter for being with Dory Aarons? We can't really, do, we can't really like, you know, give a swan song to Betty yet. She's not really done. I know, but she, she is going to come back. There's definitely more to do. It's just going to be a couple of episodes before we get to it. Remember what are you talking about? There's going to be lots of episodes. Remember when Dick Cobetti yelled at Peter because he was hanging around Dory Evans? Remember when Dick Cobetti yelled at Peter because he was thinking about girls in Hollywood? Remember when Dick Cobetti yelled at Peter for being because a, a ticket fell out of his pocket? And she's oh, well, you must be cheating on him. I love how like your your remembrance of of Mary of Betty Brand is. Remember when Dick Cobetti yelled at Peter because like that's what it all starts out as. <laughs> like, remember, when, remember when Betty visited Aunt May? Remember when Betty smiled? Remember when Betty said, "Oh, that's all right, Peter." No, it's, it's always like. Remember when Betty added like a complete tool and you know went out with <laughs> Ned Leeds right in front of him? Remember when stuff? Betty was the only woman? This Betty Brant goes down in history as the only woman who can be jealous over the fact that she's dating somebody else. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> always love that. But yeah, we're we're getting um to know Gwen a little more, and I wish Peter Parker would pay attention to me. Oh, he's paying attention to me by picking up my book. Well, we can't have that. Oh uh, God, I hate. Ser- okay, seriously. Like, like, I'll, I'll flip into it now. She's, she says, uh, Peter Parker's are the only guy who doesn't pay attention to me. And then, like, oh, her book falls, so her attention's diverted. So, you know, his ears ringing or burning, he shows up. And then, look at, look at her face. I, uh, I, I'm not going to say I'll, I want to smack her. Cause she looks so hateful. <laughs> it's like, I can't stand it. I love Dick Gwen. She's evil. She's interesting. <laughs> I'm looking to see if I wrote anything about this in my Dick Gwen article. Found on SpidermanCrawlspace.com, and I, and I really hate like I, know, I was reading ahead like uh, a few issues just for for preparation purposes. And I really hate like when like that girl gets turned on by Peter and was like, "Welcome to welcome to the club." Now you're one of us. Like, oh, uh. and then the whole looter thing. God, I hate her. Ah, Dick go Gwen. Oh, give, give me back Betty Brant. I mean, at least she was entertaining in her mania. <laughs> Dick, I mean, she was a funny sociopath, but like Dick go Gwen is just like. Uh, misanthropist. She just can't, or where computer's concerned. This is what I wrote about, like, that scene on the Crawl Space article. I said, looks like Gwen is resuming her beauty queen duties. Because remember, they said she's a beauty queen. Look at the second panel. She is really enjoying herself. Then along comes Peter Parker to remind her that not everyone worships her. It kills her, and it makes the chase to get Peter all the more attractive to her. Still, she is angry enough at being ignored to yell at him not to touch her book. She's letting It's kind of like a... The uh, Spectacular Spider-Man cartoon version of Liz Allen. But, like, okay, I can see, because, like, she's on this high because all these guys are, uh, like, treating her like, you know, the shiz. But then Peter Parker comes, and she's like, oh, yeah, this is the guy that kills my self-esteem. So that's why she's mad at him for touching the book. And, and he's not I'm, doing anything. He's just <laughs> he's minding his yeah. own business. 
And then I put, and once again, Dicko's Harry Osborne is a jerk. We also see more evidence of his love for Gwen, too. Notice how he appeared as soon as Peter tried to pick up the book. He isn't about to let anyone else chat up Gwen. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm looking at these observations that I made, like, years ago. Nice. Yeah, it, I like this issue. It was a fun issue. I like seeing the ESU gang again, because we haven't seen them for three issues. It's I find it really funny that Betty's, like, always, like really crying about this breakup, but then Peter rarely thinks about it. He's like, oh, it's another happy day in Peter Parker land. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, yeah no, I'm not, I'm not going to refute that, but, like, there are times during the issue where, like, he, like, you know, I don't, don't want to speak to Betty, but Betty is like, okay, here's, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Betty is determined to find out what the so-called secret of Peter Parker is. And then, like, the next we even hear from her, she's fled the country. <laughs> not the country, but the city. <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened that? Like, I, I, I am serious. Did she not just like you know like like okay I may I'll wait here until he goes home or you know write him a letter or call him on the phone? Like she says I must find out. And I I don't know it was like D- Dicko effing around or whatever. But I, Betty Brant, come on, just, just, no, you and your inconsistencies, you're driving, you're driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not in a good way. Well, to to her to her defense, and don't you ever make me defend Betty Brant again. Don't you dare. But in her, <laughs> in, in her defense, she did try and talk to him for the last few issues, you know, and like, and he wasn't really letting her do it. And then, but, but in this, okay, yeah, I know. But, uh, you know, to, to use some Bretonian counter logic, in this one, she says, I must find out. She wakes up in the middle of the night, freaking out, and she says, I must do it. I must. Oh, we're having a Betty Brant. Oh, she, she loved the city. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, she's she, she's going around the, the like the world looking for clues. She's like, my first clue, the Peter's Harvest secret, Day. lies in <laughs> New Jersey. Um, it looks like I have I'm a plane ticket. Can, like, can, can you imagine uh, Elizabeth Banks pulling off this uh, Betty Brant stuff you know, on I'm film? Oscar worthy. I'm trying to think of like. <laughs> Because I've seen her, she's on Thirty Rock, and she plays like a kind of neuroticish woman there. Because mm-hmm. um, she, she she's Alec Baldwin's current girlfriend on the show, and she's like carrying his baby. So she was having like pregnancy hysterics uh, last season. You should go to the Wikipedia Betty Brant page and just update it. Well, update it. Y- y'all 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 seen four, four year old version, right? She she played like a like a, a wacko woman there. Mm-hmm. On um on Scrubs, she's um J- she was JD's baby mama. Like they had a relationship, and the, he she got he got her pregnant on the first date, and then she lied about having a miscarriage to see if he would stay with her, and then he didn't stay with her, and then she yelled at him, and then she was really pregnant. And was a she had the scary. baby, and he he actually dumped her. No, she was a uh, Jordan's sister. He he actually dumps her in the middle of her giving birth to his, their child, like in. While That's she's real pregnant. nice. Yeah, but yeah, it's like, like the play I hate is from the Chappelle show. <laughs> Yeah, so she was on Scrubs and Thirty Rocks. So I mean, you have seen her pull off the crazy girlfriend thing. Yeah. Well, we're like we're, we're finding this out. Like no one else knows except for people who listen to this podcast. Everyone thinks Betty Brand was like you know the first girlfriend. And that's all you hear from her. No, no, she was the first and the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you never forget. Yeah, you never forget what. Yeah, and the woman who like blames the hobgoblin for ruining her marriage. You know, the marriage that she cheated on her husband with multiple times. The, right. The woman who, to this day, Peter, like, takes responsibility for everything that went wrong in his, in his and Betty's relationship. Like, oh, the shadow of Spider-Man stood between us. It was the shadow. We're so, we're, uh, we, we said this a thousand times, but like, we're just like, you know, this is the last Betty Brant that we'll see in a while. But in the hot oven run, she, she wants Ned to come out of the grave or whatever. So before right. we move on to the letters page, Brad, did you have any other thoughts on this issue? No, I, you know, I haven't read this issue in a good 20 years in Marvel Tales, and uh, I, I, think it's, I think it holds up. I think it's good. I give it I give it a B, probably. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a B worthy. Yeah. So the the spider's web was chock full of good stuff this issue, and and uh, so we're gonna. See, I don't get time. that in the Marvel Masterworks. Uh, next time you're on, I'll have to give you scans so you can, okay. you can see the whole issue. Um, are the letters are the letters page like four issues behind? Because I, 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 or they're talking, or they're going to talk about Master Planner, which no, issue? They're, they're, this issue is four issues behind. It, it starts out with the best letter ever. I'm going to go ahead and read this here. It's from Richard Weingard. He says, "Dear Stan and Steve, what happened to Spidey? I'm referring to the botched up Spider-Man number thirty. You seem to have forgotten to put a plot in it. You started <laughs> off with a crook called the Cat Burglar." who thinks he's too insignificant for Spidey to fight. Then you have a gang of masked crooks, whose leader is the Cat. Somewhere along the line, you mix up the two and end up with the Cat Burglar being captured 
while being called the cat. You never see the gang leader, so maybe the cat burglar is the gang leader, but you never say if anything happened to the gang. The two can't be the same person, for the gang was not said to be apprehended or disbanded. If they were supposed to be the same, then the story failed miserably. If they were supposed to be two different people, the story failed even more. You are known for your slip-ups and your nutty mistakes, but this is the first time you have come out with a whole magazine devoted to total confusion. I hope next month you'll bring back what has made Spidey such a great character. A plot. And yes, Stan this <laughs> Stanley wrote that issue. Yeah, this is basically exactly how I felt <laughs> about issue 30. I mean, I read it knowing where it was going to go in the next issue, so I knew what the mistakes were. But yeah, this is why issue 30 didn't work for me at all. Well, no, I, 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 yeah, okay. Read the next issue, though. I mean, it's like, oh, these guys, you know, have no completely unrelated. Yeah, but they... It's brought back. Yeah, but they yeah they weren't the cats gang. They were working for the master planner, but they said they were working for the cat. But they were never associated with the cat. From yeah, it, it was all a big hodgepodge mess. Then we had Tap King, who misspells Brand Eck in his letter, and they come <laughs> on it. Richard Peeney makes the understatement of the year, of the decade even, when he says that Betty isn't really sure about herself. <laughs> <laughs> How cute is that? Alan Romanock kind of missed the point of the entire series when he complained of Peter's private life getting too much time on the page versus the Spider-Man scenes. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this, this, these are the ignorant fans. He sorry, counted up in issue 30, and I think I mentioned this in the first half, but he counted up in issue 30, there were 39 Peter panels and 45 Spider-Man panels, which gives Peter almost half the screen time, and he thinks that's a problem. Then we have Gary Timmermans. He mentioned, in, in the course of talking about other things, he mentioned in passing a pledge to Marvel that was given as part of the MMMS kit, the Mary Marvel Marching Society. And I didn't realize that such a thing existed. So I googled, and here is the pledge to Marvel, should you wish to make it. I pledge allegiance to the mags of the Marvel group and to the madmen who put them on the stands. One bullpen, understaffed, indecipherable, with liberty and boo boos for all. <laughs> That's the maddest thing ever. Yeah, he did. He came up with the Mary Marvel Marching Society. John Baca writes about Marvel Tales Annual 2, thanking them for the reprint of A Monster Among Us, which came from Amazing Adult Fantasy No. 8 by Leon Ditko. He asks for more reprints of Amazing Fantasy or the return of the original book which Stan uses as the opportunity to plug the new book Fantasy Masterpieces, which we'll be talking about more in just a second. Well, so I never heard of that. That's Date just a reprint book, isn't it? Yeah, for a while. <laughs> it goes through some <laughs> phases. Yeah. A title full of reprints? Wonderful. I don't think it had anything new in it, did it? It changed its name and had new stuff for nine issues. Oh, okay. David Greenlee of Weatherford, Texas, and I have family out in that town. I wonder if they know David. Uh, he pleads that they both kill Aunt May and reveal Peter's secret identity. <laughs> that never okay. happens, does it? That'll he, happen in 2007. He goes on to say... <laughs> uh, May will be shot and everyone will know that Peter's Spider-Man. He goes on to say that if they wait 40 years to grant his wish, they better not just pretend or tease the ideas, only to rip them away through the most notorious retcom of comics history. Oh, you're making that up. Because if that's what they're going to do, he's just going to stop reading now. Yeah, wow. yeah, I made that second part that's up. A, that's yeah. total BS. That's, that's <laughs> Stan, Stan wrote that part. Steve wrote that part. <laughs> and the bottom of the letters page has a blurb for the new series, Fantasy Masterpieces, another bullpen bombshell. See the early work of Kirby, Ditko, Heck, Ayers, and Sinnott. Prefaces awesome. by Stan Lee. On sale now, only 12 cents. Which makes a nice segue for us to move over to the bullpen bulletins page. Ooh, what do we got? Marvel Bullpen Bulletins, the latest gossip, gags, and gizmos from your bullpen to you. The only announcement here that pertains to us is the wrap-up. For those of you who are Marvel maniacs in the old days, when we featured fantasy mags about the nuttiest assortment of aliens, monsters, and cavorting kooks you ever saw, and for those of you who missed those nutty, nifty, nostalgic yarns, we've got a thrilling surprise. Just for the fun of it, just so we can see what the work of our favorite artists looked like years ago, just so we can read some of those famous old fantasy classics Stan was battling out by the dozens before the Marvel Age. In other words, just for old times' sake, we're adding a new title to our lineup of hits, 
fantasy masterpieces. The Great First Ish is on sale right now, and you've just got to get it. It'll be published bi-monthly, and each ish is certain to become a treasured collector's item minutes after it's off the press. Of course. <laughs> That sounds really, In really other words, cool. So we can like reprint stuff without having to actually pay writers <laughs> to produce new material. But remember, I, it was it was a different market. I don't, get, I don't have to read those then. Well, here's the funny thing. It advertised itself as being reprints of stories from the golden age of Marvel. Like that's a big banner across the cover of the first issue. But in the like first issue ten months ago. All the stories were from nineteen fifty nine to nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty like the closest thing with there we would be like a there was even one from Amazing Adult Fantasy 10, five months before Spider-Man debuted. And it was after the Fantastic Four had already started up. So these aren't Golden Age stories, at least not when it started up. But after a couple of issues, they started making uh, Golden Age superhero story reprints, like Cats in America and Torch and Submariner and stuff, which would make these stories available to Silver Age readers for the first time. Well, I, I know this, it's, probably, this is probably not the case because of copyright reasons, but like, would they reprint... All those stuff that the, the former creators did, or was it all stuff under the uh, timely books? Like I remember, I remember telling you, John, you know, if they were printing like some of the romance comics from Romita and Kirby, I would be all over that. I think these were the, it started out as mostly the weird sci-fi stuff from like like I said, the late fifties and, and and into the sixties, and then they started doing the World War II superheroes. The reason that I'm bringing this up at all as part of this show, besides the fact that it's just a part of Marvel's history, is that we'll be revisiting this series down the road because it will hit issue 14, and by that time its name will have changed to Marvel oh, Superheroes, Superheroes, and issue oh. 14's lead story is a Spidey solo feature. Da, da, da. So we're looking for coverage of that in about six months. Uh, I see. I have that issue, by the way. That was one of the only... One of the few new stories, and then it became a Hulk reprint book, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. From from twelve to twenty, it would it would have a lead news story with Golden Age backups. Mm-hmm. You had two issues of Captain Marvel, oh. a Spider Man, a Medusa, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy had their debut there, a Kazar story, a Doctor the first Doctor Doom solo story, and the Phantom Eagle, who was a attempt to make a World War One. Hero that did not go anywhere at all. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little past the strip. Yeah. Speaking of the Hulk, there is an ad for a new Incredible Hulk sweatshirt being yeah. worn by Doctor Doom as part of a little three-pound <laughs> trip that is pretty much dumb. I'm going to act this out for you guys. So you have Doctor Doom and Hulk talking to each other, and Doctor Doom says, "Sir, would you mind stepping aside? You are standing on my foot. Step aside yourself, sir. I am not so inclined." I am the Hulk, and I come and go where I please. Aha. So awesome. a formidable appearance is your passport to social acceptance? Well, I too can be socially acceptable. And so can anyone. And he opens up his cape, and here he is, Dr. Doom, wearing a Here Comes the Hulk sweatshirt. With a high-quality, brilliantly colored, run-resistant, illustrated on the front and back, incredible Hulk sweatshirt. Sacrilege. <laughs> and there's a big arrow pointing to him. It says, biggest surprise of the year. Just wait till you see what's on the back of the shirt. Okay, the front of the shirt has the Hulk rampaging towards you. The back of the shirt is if the camera were behind the Hulk. So it's like the back of the Hulk rampaging away. Yeah. So, I don't know, I guess that's pretty cool. I remember, I remember that ad. So that's, that's fun. That's, that's impossible. <laughs> I, 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 I can't imagine Dr. Doom being such a sellout. <laughs> I can be socially accessible too, and I'll show you how with this. It was a Doom bot. It was a Doom bot. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of a little cool, cool sweatshirt. And on the ads pages this month, we had two more Triumphs for Marvel on sale now. And at last, it's here. Folks, Fantastic Four 48, featuring the first appearances of both the Silver Surfer and Galactus and the first character to be called the Punisher. If this be Doomsday, is that right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Just great great issue. To destroy this planet, why must I save it? No. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that title, though. To save you, why must I kill you? That's like the greatest. That's like, like if a hostage should die. Right. I love this. I love those titles. God bless them. To dry <laughs> myself off, why must I jump in the lake? No, 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 no. no like, like, like to dry myself off, why must the towel get wet? Oh, there it is. Now you're getting metaphysical on us. Oh yes. And in Tales to Astonish number seventy-seven. Rick Jones reveals that Bruce Banner is the Hulk. 
I'm Rick you Jones, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he reveals it while, while you know driving his pimp mobile and you know coming out with his cane and his gold too. Now, I think at that nice. point he he thought that the Hulk was dead. Am I correct, John? Yeah, right. it was something like that. It's been a while since I've read the story, but but like the Hulk was dead or dying, and so he revealed he was Bruce Banner in order to save his life. I'm not a big follower of the Hulk. I've read these books. I like the character, but I've seen him handled so poorly so often that I just don't really read him much. But it seemed to me like revealing that he was Bruce Banner was like a necessary turn, kind of like Thor giving up the Don Blake persona. It was just a natural outgrowth of where the character had gone. Well, uh, in, 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 the, in the third Spider-Man annual, like it's what, like I remember, like the whole that was like the only time I've ever seen it where it's supposed to be a secret. Like, don't tell anybody, but I'm actually Bruce Banner, and Spider-Man say, like, "Oh, really?" It was revealed to the military. It was still kept secret from the rest of the world for a little while because they didn't want everyone to know that you know one of their doctors was the Hulk. But Brad, you you're the resident Hulk fan. What um yeah? What do you think about this this turn of events? Did you read through these? Uh, I'm not as versed on the Tales to Astonish stuff as I am the regular Hulk stuff, but I I think it's natural. I agree what you said for the for the identity of Bruce Banner to eventually come out. It's one of the hi- few heroes that. Uh, Came out, you knew who his uh, alias was, his alter ego. So now, to ra- before we wrap up this episode, it is time for a 1965 year in review. 1965 year in review. It's been a pretty straightforward year for Spidey as far as comic appearances go. Only one minor cameo in the Fantastic Four annual. Other than that, he stayed in his own book and had a great ride. Let's see where we've been this year. Both Frederick Foswell and the Green Goblin returned in issue 23, bringing with them the Goblin's actual secret alter ego hiding in Jameson's business club. Spider-Man went mad and sought solace in the arms of Dr. Ludwig Reinhardt, a.k.a. Mysterio. Luckily, he had his sidekick Flash Thompson there to save him. Oh, yeah. Jonah decided he had not incriminated himself enough yet, so he hired Smythe to stick some tentacles on Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons, and he uses her to try to capture (laughs) Spider-Man. While in the meantime, Aunt May plays her trump card. That's right, Betty Brant and Liz Allen meet Mary Jane Watson. The Crime Master teams up with the Green Goblin to take down Spider-Man, and Foswell starts wearing rubber when he goes out in public. Because that's what you learn to do in prison. But the crime wait, 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 what? <laughs> you know, the patch mask. It was rubber. But the crime master gets taken down before he can reveal to the world that the Green Goblin is really J. Jonah Jameson. Peter Parker graduates high school despite the molten man's non-molten attempts to stop him. And Liz Allen exits stage left. And then comes backstage right for five minutes. Yeah, for five <laughs> Yeah, she's being stalked. Supernatural hijinks ensue when Xandu steals the Wand of Watum, and Spider-Man needs a doctor to help him survive a very strange tale. You see what I did there? Ha ha, I got it. (laughs) As they journey into a mystery. (laughs) Betty went into hysterics at the attack of the Scorpion, and Ned takes advantage of her vulnerability to propose marriage. Aunt May starts fainting, and purple guys start running around while Spider-Man stops a cat burglar. Peter starts college and meets three new major players in whose deaths he will have a hand, or at least will believe he did for a long time. (laughs) And then Aunt May is on her deathbed as Spider-Man seeks help from a lizard, but is ambushed by Dr. Octopus, and then lifts the world off his shoulders Atlas style, before finally telling Betty exactly where she can stick it. And finally, (laughs) Craven attacks as Betty flees town and Peter fails at making friends at Empire State University. But I'm feeling lucky, Miss Watson. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) So we had no crossovers, only one minor cameo in the Fantastic Four wedding. And I'd say it was a pretty solid year. So I'm going to take a quick poll. Do anyone out of this year have a best or favorite issue? 25, hands down. 25? 33. 33. Right, I know that you haven't read these in a while, but do you have a, a best or favorite issue out of that list? From what what issue to what issue? Again? Twenty-three to thirty-four. The the uh, thirty. Where is he lifting the stuff off of him? Thirty-three. That's that's my pick. Why why is twenty-five years, Josh? <laughs> uh, that that issue has uh, that's the first Spider Slayer story, and there's yeah. just so much going on with like 
almost all the plot lines of the book come together. You got Flash being Flash. You got one of my favorite Liz versus Betty moments, and you have the first appearance of Mary Jane. And That's an honorable mention for me. That's like, like yeah. in second place. I don't, I, I don't think you get past 33. I mean, that everybody comes back to that infamous scene, and when the, the Ditko artwork builds where he's so small in the panel and he's then he's lifting stuff up. I mean, you don't get better than that, in my opinion. I actually enjoyed 32 a bit more than 33. The middle you, part of the ooh, story. Controversial. Because I, I, ha- I only had very minor quibbles with it. It brought back Kirk Connors. There was a lot of great action with Peter and a fury and determination that we had never seen before. Is is the first time he really goes crazy trying to you know find help for Aunt May, and it had an amazing cliffhanger with him being trapped in that rubble and the water creeping in. Yeah, I, I really got more out of that than I did out of the self exploration, lifting the stuff off your back. I know that's an iconic moment, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, does anyone have a worst or least favorite issue? Issue thirty two. No, <laughs> <laughs> I hated thirty two. That piece of crap. <laughs> No, Maybe no. annual two. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, I haven't like, read like, annual two. Annual. I don't remember it much. It's a it Doctor very... Strange team up. Xandu yeah. steals the one of what two, and it's really it's kind of yeah. I'll get. I'll go with annual two then. Yeah, that I was. I was trying to decide between annual two and thirty because I just the cat burglar and the oh, the Betty stuff, the bad plot with the the purple guys and how that wasn't matching up with the next story, but. The Betty stuff edges that one above, so Annual 2 is also my least favorite. Anybody like uh, have a best new villain? Our new villains were... Ooh, my yeah, favorite that's... new villain is Betty Brandt. <laughs> <laughs> Ned Leeds. Oh, new villain, new villain. Who, who are okay, okay, here, 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 here are the new villains. We have Jonah's Robot, which later knows the Spider Slayer, oh, the yes. Crime Master, Molten Man, Xandu, and the Cat. So best... Yeah. Jonah villain. Robot. Say him again. Jonah's robot, the crime master, molten man, Xandu, and the cat. Be crime master. Crime master. Jonah's robot because it's Doctor Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> isn't jo- isn't Jonah's robot the one with Jonah's face in the belly? Yeah. Yeah, like like, like, like the, the, the head. Yeah. that Gerard so eloquently put. I guess molten man. I mean, he's been around the longest, and but he's not one of my favorites though. And I, I, I of the I list. can't remember the cat for shit. The cat burglar. He that's, that's from should. thirty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's from thirty. Yeah. He actually is the second prowler in a spectacular issue much, much later down the road. Yeah. But that's almost, you know, forgettable. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go with you on Molten Man, Brad. That he he's my of the list, my favorite. Yeah, the list is pretty poor. Worst, yeah, it is, actually. Yeah, this issue did not have a lot of great new villains. This this year wasn't so hot on new villains, but I think the mass plan was a standout, but that that at the same time that's cheating because it's Doc Ock. Right, right. How about a worst new villain of that list? Jonah's Robot, Crime Master, Molten Man, Xandu, and the Cat. Xandu. Xandu. Uh, the Cat. No, it's Xandu. Yeah, I'm going to go with Xandu. I mean... But, I, however, Xanadu is not bad. <laughs> he just... Yeah. And and maybe he, they could have used him to better effect in a different story. It's just that whole... Everything about that annual just did not work for me. Which is kind of crazy because it get, it's going to get some rave reviews we're going to see in the next issue's letters page, I think. If I remember right. Another thing I asked last time, and I'm not sure how well it worked, were uh, favorite and least favorite character moments or story beats. I, imagine I know what Josh's that, is. <laughs> I imagine that lifting this stuff off your shoulders is probably going to be the king of the of the year. Yep. yep. Anything else you want to bring out? I think the worst character moments is with Aunt May and the washing of the apple and the feeding oh cake. I mean, I mean, even in the 1960s, you got to be like, what is up with this broad? And he's 18 years old, for God's sake. Yeah, exactly. I have two favorite moments. There's uh, obviously the meaning of Mary Jane Watson, but the moment that has the most emotional satisfaction for me is issue 30, Peter finally <laughs> telling Betty off. Like, yes. after all the crap that he's put up, after all the stuff he's put up with from her, <laughs> he, he, he just finally, you know, like, tells her off uh, and leaves her crying, you know, like, at the door, begging for him to come back. That's a very that's a very uh, heartwarming moment for everyone who's in the audience who's a misogynist. One thing about what you were saying, someone someone through the you know mentioned that Peter's eighteen years old now. We, we've talked a lot about in the whole context of Betty and Ned, how if Ned is in his upper teens, like eighteen, nineteen, maybe twenty, 
then the idea of him proposing to a girl who's a year or two his junior may not be that bizarre in the 60s because once you graduated high school, generally you were expected to do whatever you need to do to take care of you know your house and be a man. So Peter is now in that position. Yeah, he's going on to, to college, but he's 18 years old. He's the main provider for the household, and yet Aunt May still treats him like he's five. Yeah, which is that—that that is the worst part of the the whole thing. Like yes, it is. Okay, well, that is our year in review, and with that, that wraps up the episode. Brad, thank you so much for joining us for this second half. No problem. I didn't fall asleep like Michael Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Michael will never live that down. <laughs> I, I, you, you see, I, I would just want to say that. Oh, when we end with a zing to friend of the show and former guest co-host Michael Bailey. Michael, don't shoot the messenger or editor. It's not like I can cut that stuff out. You know what I'm saying? So that brings us to the end of this episode of Amazing Spider-Man Classics. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank Scott Gardner and Brad Douglas for joining us on this show. Scott has been an inspiration to me in my podcasting and a good friend of mine for quite some time now. And I feel like the technical difficulties and other issues that kept the whole gang from getting together might have shortchanged him a little bit. So we're going to have him back on the show just as soon as we can find a story that he's interested in doing. Have a lot of respect for all that he does in the comic book podcasting world. And of course, Brad Douglas being the web host of SpidermanCrawlSpace.com, possibly the biggest Spider-Man fan website on the internet. His endeavors and his support of this show have also been invaluable. So thanks to both of them for being with us, and we look forward to having them again in the near future. If you guessed that Brad Douglas's time with us here tonight was recorded at the same time as his time with us on the email segment for episode 21, then you would be correct. So a little bit of sneaky behind-the-scenes magic for you there. Okay, next time, issues 35 and 36 of Amazing Spider-Man. In the meantime, should you wish to contact the show, please do so at AmazingSpiderManClassics at gmail.com. We will be reading emails next time, and we look forward to receiving yours. Also, you can find the show at AmazingSpiderMan.Libsyn.com. You can download the MP3s there, leave comments on the postings, and find the link to our Facebook page. I also invite you to subscribe to the show through iTunes. There have been some issues in recent weeks with iTunes updating their RSS feeds in a timely manner. And I was going to say on here that I'm aware of the situation in case it continues to be a problem, but when I put up my latest episode of Golden Age Superman, which you can also find on iTunes and at goldenagesuperman.lipson.com, that is a shameless plug. When I put up my latest episode of that show, I woke up the next morning and found that iTunes had already updated their RSS feeds as they used to be in the habit of doing. So hopefully those problems are now resolved. The only other thing I have to say before signing off here today is happy birthday, Lily Wilson, turning nine years old on January 28th. And as always, my name is John Wilson. Until next time, thank you for listening to Amazing Spider-Man Classics. Good night. She wants to give Artie and Sam, like, you know, big old cakes to make them feel better. It's pretty funny. Aww. Too bad they're dead. Are they really dead? <laughs> yeah, they're both dead. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't laugh, but, like... <laughs> I know, I'm not, not going to leave that in there, but, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're both gone. Um, Baby, so yeah. Hey.
how have you recovered from that heart attack? Why don't we test things out? Oh no! And then we're gonna have like, and then we're gonna have like that Jonah Senior and Aunt May sex scene, like. Re- okay, I already threw up in my mouth a little bit. We need to stop. <laughs> is Aunt May from this issue able to have sex anytime? Soon? Like I ever, ever. Like, I, like the, the thought ever crossed my mind. <laughs> the the opening's still there. Just gotta grease it up. Oh, oh hey oh hey oh oh, oh Jesus Christ! Wow wow <laughs> WDC. Oh, that was good. Maybe. This is podcasting after dark. <laughs> John, blo- blooper that shit. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> this is, when Brad this Douglas is, comes on, the, the jokes come flying and the clothes come off. I know. This, this, isn't, skin-a- this isn't Skinamax, it's Spandamax. I know. It's, it's, it's like. Spandex Max. Okay. 